30 years of married life, it would seem for such a long period of time spouses should know each other very well, so as not to expect from each other mean betrayal. But sometimes, something happens that you don't expect at all. Gentlemen, let's hear the story of one marital infidelity, when betrayal comes from an unexpected direction. Did you know that an average high school romance lasts only three weeks? Katie, Thomas, and Greg Hollander proved that this is not the case after living together for an impressive 40 years. Their love story began when Katie was a freshman and Greg was a sophomore, and since then they have always been close to each other. Their love was real and lasting, standing the test of time and not losing its magic. Surprisingly, Kat and I have been married for about 30 of those years. I once thought our happiness was genuine. Our marriage was complete and the birth of our daughter Joan strengthened our bond. In general, I was happy with that time. My name is Thomas Marsh, and Katie has been my faithful wife for almost 30 years. As already mentioned, Kat and Greg were high school sweethearts, and with him she lost her innocence. Many school relationships are short-lived, but for Greg and Katie, their breakup was more of a temporary one. Greg, being a year older than Katie, planned to save up money after graduation to marry her. This is a story my wife often recalled during our marriage. After graduating from high school, Greg and his uncle went to work on a pipeline project in Alaska, which was the beginning of their problems. Shortly after arriving, Greg stopped contacting her, leaving Katie to live out her senior year alone. She dated someone named Sam or Simpson for a while, but her heart was devoted to Greg. Despite Kat's patience, Greg continued to be absent and uncommunicative. Greg seemed content with his job and nomadic lifestyle, believing that Katie was patiently waiting for him to succeed and knock her down after his return. But life continued to move forward, and reality painted a different picture. Katie graduated from university, got her degree, and we met at a party when she was 24 years old. I was 29, I was a little older, but we complimented each other well. I immediately fell in love with her and believed that she had the same feelings for me. Our marriage was normal, except for a slight hitch. Two days before our wedding, a letter arrived from Greg, who, like a prodigal son returning home, asked Katie to meet him. Kat's mom intervened in time, who convinced her to let Greg go and focus on her future. Despite several tense moments when it seemed that the wedding might be canceled, Kat eventually agreed and became my wife, taking the name Mrs. Katie Marsh. By the time Greg showed up, we had already spent our honeymoon, and it turned out that a broken heart had forced him to join the Marines. After returning from our honeymoon, we started a new life. Kat worked as a nurse, and I got a job as an insurance agent for a well-known company. Although my marriage remained strong, a suspicious situation arose. Greg started texting with Katie, and she responded willingly. When I asked her about it, she became defensive, claiming that he was just an old friend who needed support in a lonely Marine, and she was just trying to raise his morale. I couldn't pretend to be ignorant, because I knew about their frequent communication and her answers. She persisted, until the news came that he had married someone from his social circle, which ended their relationship, and brought me a sense of relief. Over the next three years, she received only three Christmas cards from Greg, which marked the end of their communication. It was during this period of silence with Greg that our daughter Joan was born. Taking the newborn in our arms, Katie and I joined forces to create a home and farm for Joan's bright future. Those were really happy times when we took care of and raised our daughter together. As it often happens in life, there was a hitch. One day Katie received a letter from Greg, and although we never talked about it, I noticed that our stamp consumption had increased. It was obvious that she had resumed communication with him. Despite this, I decided not to pay attention to it, considering that his duty is to defend democracy, and I care about the well-being of my family. If they want to communicate with each other, then it seemed to me that it was their business, regardless of my feelings. After a while, Kat started sharing the details she had learned from Greg. He went through a divorce, but then remarried. He served in combat and received numerous awards for his service. 
Kat talked enthusiastically about her former Marine. Although it was hard for me to see that she was still talking about him, I hoped that one day she would put it in the past and focus on our family. Unfortunately, this long-awaited day never came. Greg devoted three decades to serving in the Marine Corps, survived three marriages and divorces, and amassed a collection of medals that could rival even General Patton's collection. With a sense of disappointment, I realized that if Greg had become more charismatic to my wife over time, then I had simply aged and become more routine. The only consolation for me was the hope that Greg had moved away from us after he was fired. Unfortunately, this wish did not come true, and now we find ourselves in this situation. Our daughter Joan has grown into a mature girl and is happily married to Frank Campbell. The exciting news is that they are expecting their first child. When I turn 60, I look forward to 65, so that I can retire and spend my remaining years in peace. Katie is still as beautiful as ever, and is able to make my heart beat faster. I never imagined that my quiet life would be disrupted. When I returned home on Thursday, I was surprised to find that Kat looked absolutely flawless. She excitedly informed me about the dinner order for 7 o'clock, which at first puzzled me. I went over everything in my head that I could forget, but soon realized that there was no reason for a fancy dinner. Intrigued, I decided to agree and quickly changed in our bedroom, trying my best to match Kat's sophistication. Dinner turned out to be amazing, and even though the restaurant was buzzing around us, I couldn't help feeling that Kat had something more on her mind than just enjoying a delicious meal. When we finished eating, I casually told her, Kat, now is the time to tell me what you wanted. I promise I won't make a scene. I'm in a good mood. One of my oddities is that I never lose my temper in public, a habit I picked up from working in the insurance industry. Kat knew this about me, so when she needed to say something difficult, she always chose a public place for it. Tonight I realized that something was bothering her just by looking at her expression. I felt terrified, sure that she would ruin my evening. Finally, with concern, she shared the news. Tom, I think you should know that Greg is back. Suddenly I felt sick, but I knew it wasn't because of the food. I glanced at her, waiting for details, but Kat was just looking at me thoughtfully. Finally, I broke the awkward silence. When you say he's back, do you mean he's back on vacation? She shook her head and whispered softly. Tom, he's not on vacation. He was discharged from the army and he bought a house two streets away from us, she said. Feeling the panic building in me, I quickly interrupted her. And he's going to live there with his third wife? She shook her head cautiously and replied, No, he's divorced again. Because of her, he had to lose part of his pension. Trying to contain my anger, I muttered, Damn, this is too much. Nearby, the diners looked at me in surprise. I was swearing not because Greg lost part of his pension because of his ex-wife, but because he moved closer to us, and I was interested to find out about the reasons. I became more confident and asked Katie, Have you met Greg? The look on her face told me everything I wanted to know. She didn't even answer when I asked how and when it happened. When she finally spoke, she looked a little depressed and said, Greg came to us yesterday and informed us that we are now neighbors. My heart was pounding as I continued the interrogation, gripped by fear of what I might find out. Did you sleep with him, Cat? Her face betrayed the truth even before she said those words. Yes, Tom, but it's not what you think. I stared into her eyes, feeling a surge of anger. So my faithful wife admits that she slept with another man. Now tell me why it's not what I think it is. She tried to justify herself. I did it because he needed me, Tom. He looked so lost when he came to me. He was worried about the divorce and turned to me for help. Trying to support him, I couldn't ignore my conflicting feelings. I love you, Tom, but I also understand that I still have feelings for Greg. That's how the truth was revealed. My wife was with Greg, using his post-traumatic stress disorder and their divorce to get back into her heart and into her bed. I looked into her eyes. My voice was firm and determined. Okay, Cat. The damage is done. We can sort this out and move on. 
but you can't go back to him. Do you understand? Tears welled up in her eyes as she said softly but decisively, I can't make you that promise, Tom. I have feelings for him, and he needs me more than you do. To hear these words, especially in a crowded restaurant, was a surprise to me. I asked for the bill. As we drove home, I couldn't resist bringing up the subject again. Cat, how can you continue to be with him when you have a husband? Have you forgotten about the vow we made to each other almost three decades ago, promising to leave everyone else? Tears streamed down her face as she confessed through sobs. I'm sorry, Tom, but he needs me. We found each other again and I can't stand the thought of losing him or you. I didn't know what to say or how to get her to give up on him. Disappointed, I said, What do you suggest? Shall we take turns dividing you up? Will he be with you on New Year's Eve and I will be with you on Christmas? I tried to reason with her. You can't have two men, Cat. Her tears dried and she looked at me curiously. Can we take a break, Tom? I felt a pang of embarrassment. What do you mean, Cat? She turned the conversation to something else. Do you remember 18 years ago when you took a year off to get your master's degree? You did what was necessary and then you went back to work and everything was fine. I shook my head in disappointment. Cat, how can you equate my education for the benefit of our family and company with your connection with this man, which is currently beneficial only to you two? When I parked the car in the driveway and turned off the engine, Cat reached out and gently stroked my face, her eyes full of love and despair. Tom, she began, I missed my last year of school with Greg, and if I had that time, maybe we wouldn't be in such a predicament today. Please give me this year to fix everything. We'll get rid of Greg together, and I swear I'll be the best wife for you. I just need this chance, Tom. Please. When I listened to her plea, I was overwhelmed by a wave of emotions, sadness, pain, shock, and a deep sense of despair. I had a strong urge to grab Katie by the neck and squeeze until her eyes went dark. But then I remembered the consequences of such actions. I remembered stories about husbands who lost their freedom and possessions in fits of rage. Instead, I said to Katie, Okay, if that's what you really want, but know that I don't approve of it, and I don't want to see or hear from you for the next year. Understand that after that you may have no one to return to. I hoped that by setting strict conditions for her vacation, I could temper her enthusiasm. Nevertheless, it was obvious that my efforts had been in vain. She didn't seem to pay attention to my words and even agreed with them. Kissing me on the cheek, she thanked me and promised that I would not regret it. I shook my head and told her it was too late. She wanted intimacy that night, but I chose to ignore her. The very thought of her being with Greg made me sick, and I couldn't think about being physically intimate with her. I took a pillow and told her that I would sleep in the guest room noticing the resentment in her eyes. Part of me was secretly glad, hoping she'd change her mind. When I woke up the next morning, I hoped that the previous night had been just a one-time thing and that Kat would change her mind in daylight. To my disappointment, this did not happen. When I entered the kitchen, I saw that she was happily preparing breakfast, as if she had just won the lottery. She smiled at me and pointed to the calendar on the wall, where today's date was circled in bold black marker, the 6th of June. Sitting at the table, I couldn't help but think about the irony of the situation. In the year 1944, a great many brave soldiers fought to free Europe from tyranny, and I'm losing my wife to some oppressor. Katie served me breakfast with a smile. She reassured me by saying, I know you're worried but I'll be back in a year and I'll be completely devoted to you. I just need time to figure things out, and I promise you won't regret it. Her smile was full of satisfaction as she looked at me, and then she spoke. I called Greg this morning while you were still asleep and told him that you approved of my vacation. He'll pick me up in an hour. When she spoke, my heart was heavy, but I knew I had to give her one last chance. Cat, you don't have to do this. Please take the time to think about it. You can't be sure that you can get rid of him in a year. Focus on freeing yourself from his power and working to rebuild our marriage, I begged her. 
I'm asking you not to take any chances and destroy what we have. She smiled smugly at me and said softly, Tom, I appreciate the love you've shown by giving me this time. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. Our marriage will be stronger when I return. And now I have to finish packing, darling, so finish your breakfast. With that, she left the kitchen, signaling her departure from our marriage. Forcing myself to eat the unappetizing food, I went to get dressed. When I entered our bedroom, I saw Kat's three suitcases full of her things. She looked at me with a smile and said, I think I have everything I need. Could you take these suitcases out on the porch? I stood there, not knowing what to say. In the end, I shook my head and said, No. Her smile faded, and she looked at me in surprise. I continued, If you're going to end our 30-year marriage, then you and that idiot can carry your suitcases together. Kat was on the verge of tears when she whispered, He's not an idiot. Greg is a wonderful man and a hero who bravely served our country. He has achieved more than you have. I looked away, quietly admitting, Yes, he deserved medals, while I worked tirelessly five days a week to support you and our daughter. Maybe you're right. Katie carried her luggage to the exit, giving me disapproving looks as she took each bag. Soon a car pulled up to our house, and a man, who, as I understood, was Greg, began unloading her things from the porch. After telling him she was coming, Katie came back to say goodbye to me. We stood opposite each other in awkward silence, and I spoke first. If you're really going to carry out this ridiculous idea, remember the contract. I don't want any contact for a year. I saw that she was beginning to understand the situation when she said softly, I understand, Tom, but everything will fall into place. Just wait and see. You promised to give me this year. She paused, waiting for my reaction, but I didn't say anything. Eventually, with a puzzled expression on her face, she whispered, You are very dear to me. She bent down to kiss me, but I dodged, and she touched my cheek. I can't kiss you knowing that you're going to him. With tears in her eyes, she ran out of the house and threw herself into his arms. I stood at the front door and watched her hug him passionately, feeling a surge of anger inside me. Two minutes later, the driveway was empty reflecting the emptiness in my heart as I finally accepted that my wife was now with another man. That morning, I called work and immediately went to the hardware store to buy new locks. By changing the locks in the house and updating the security codes for the alarm system, I somehow took my mind off Katie. But as soon as I did everything, sadness crept up on me again, sweeping over me like a crashing wave. In a desperate attempt to numb the pain, I turned off my home phone and started drinking heavily. But this method of struggle proved ineffective. My struggle with excessive alcohol consumption continued until Sunday morning. I felt completely exhausted physically, spiritually, and mentally. Finally, I decided to go to bed and quickly fell into a deep sleep, but was suddenly awakened by a knock that rang throughout the house. Still sleepy, I fussed around trying to figure out where the noise was coming from, but it turned out to be my daughter Joan knocking on the front door. When I let her in, she was stunned by my disheveled appearance and the strong smell of alcohol in the air. Her first question was, Dad, what's going on? Trying to concentrate because of the severe headache, I managed to mumble, What do you mean? She looked at me with a confused expression on her face and led me into the kitchen. You need coffee and food, Dad, she said. Then you can tell me what's going on. An hour later, after eating and drinking coffee, I told her everything I knew about her mother and Greg. She was in shock. Dad, let me make sure that I understand correctly. Does Mom want to take a one-year break from your marriage to be with her ex-high school boyfriend? I nodded, confirming that she understood everything. Her subsequent questions reflected the same fears that had plagued me since Friday. What are you going to do, Dad? Her eyes met mine, and my answer sounded almost automatic. Tomorrow I will take sick leave and seek legal help. Joanna's expression darkened as she put forward a theory. 
I can't understand why mom is acting like this. Maybe she has a mental disorder? I replied with a detached look. I don't even know. She looked at me with a sadness I had never seen before. I do not know what to tell you, dad, but I urge you to change your mind. Joan stayed a little longer to cook dinner for later. When she left, she kissed me and apologized. Before she left, I asked her, why did you come here today? She looked into my eyes and replied, my mom called me and told me to check on you, but she didn't tell me why. I nodded, pretending to understand. Okay, thanks. Please drive carefully, dear. I had a meeting with my lawyer on Monday. My intuition about Katie turned out to be correct. Despite the fact that the divorce was leaning in my favor due to the resistance of my wife, who did not allow her to claim half of my pension, there were unresolved issues with the common property. Now I believe that moving away from Katie will help resolve these issues. The next three weeks flew by, and I was surprised at how well I adjusted to being alone. The positive thing was that I felt that the burden of responsibility for someone else was lifted from my shoulders, although there were drawbacks to being alone when waking up and going to bed. I didn't hear from Katie until mid-July. One Saturday, I decided to go to Flynn's, a trendy tavern in our city. And while sitting at the bar, I noticed that they were walking hand in hand, looking like teenagers in love. Their love for each other was so obvious that they seemed completely unaware of my presence. Watching them, I couldn't help but notice Greg's trim and somewhat attractive appearance, which made it clear why Katie was so attached to him. He seemed to have a strong influence on her, and she obediently followed his wishes. While he was talking, she was listening intently. When she saw me at the bar, she smiled shyly, came out of the bathroom and came up to me. Hi, Tom. How are you? What is it? She asked hesitantly. Despite the temptation to brush her off, I remained polite and replied, Oh, it's not worse than it happens, especially when the wife I've lived with for 30 years suddenly leaves for someone else. How can I help you? My sarcastic comments seemed to puzzle her, but she remained adamant. Tom, I really need to get into our house. I left some personal items there, but my key didn't work when I tried to enter the house the other day, she explained. I smiled and replied in a friendly way. Well, Kat, no wonder your key doesn't work in my house because you don't live there anymore. She looked at me with a confused expression on her face before I added, I think you should go back to your boyfriend before he gets worried. Her eyes filled with tears and she left, and I concentrated on finishing my drink. Suddenly, a rough hand grabbed my shoulder and spun me around to face an enraged Greg. Hey, you made my woman cry and I don't like it, he growled. I felt that he was about to hit me, and fear gripped me, because I knew that he could easily overpower me before anyone could help. Having plucked up the courage, I decided to act. You're talking about my wife, not your girlfriend. And since you took her away from me, you have no right to interfere in our relationship. Feel free to hit me if you want. But remember the consequences associated with the police. I could see the gears turning in his head, knowing that Greg wasn't the smartest person. But this only spurred my determination to continue the confrontation with him. Now you have two options. The first is to hit me and face legal consequences. Or the second one, leave this room and think about your stupid actions. My heart was pounding and the voice in my head was screaming at me, but I kept a semblance of courage while Greg weighed his decisions. Fortunately, the manager arrived in time and asked what caused such a commotion. Greg glanced at him and then reluctantly returned to Katie. Five minutes later, they paid the bill and left. On the way, I was thinking about what personal items Katie needed in the house and I wanted to find out. I spent three hours searching unsuccessfully until I finally found the boxes hidden under her dresser. Underneath them were letters from Greg, meant for Kat. When I looked through them, it became obvious that this relationship with Greg had been going on for many years. One of the letters, written five years ago, read, It's nice to know that you still miss me. When I get back, we'll be together. You'll need to figure out how to get rid of your feeble-minded husband. Looking through them was like reading a trashy novel. 
Some talked about his intentions towards Kat, while others talked about how they went to school. Kat finally contacted me on September 1st when it was my birthday. When I returned home from work, I was surprised to find a covered dish and a greeting card on the porch. After bringing them into the house, I was touched to see that she had prepared my favorite stew. There was a note inside. Tom, I know we shouldn't talk, but I couldn't ignore your birthday. I think about us every night and I believe that by the end of this year I will be with you and he will be gone. Please never stop loving me and don't leave us. My daughter Joan has been following me since Kat left and called to congratulate me. Then she finally revealed the reason for her call. Dad, you know that I have to give birth in three weeks, right? How could I forget about the birth of my first grandchild? There was a slight pause after which she continued. Dad, Frank and I had dinner with Mom and Greg. Mom really wants to witness the birth of my child and wants Greg to be by her side. I understand that you and Mom agreed not to communicate for a year, but could you make an exception for me at least this time? I was taken aback to find out that Joan and her husband were having dinner with them but I didn't want to spoil the special moment of her firstborn's birth. Okay, Joan, she can come and bring this jerk if necessary, I said reluctantly. Joan quickly intervened. Dad, please stop calling him names. Greg is a good guy and he brings mom happiness. I haven't seen her this happy in a long time. I was shocked, but then anger overwhelmed me, and I answered, First you all had lunch together and now you're defending him? I do not know what his intentions are, but he is gradually driving a wedge between me and my family. Just out of curiosity, when will you start calling him dad? She spoke hurriedly, with regret in her voice. Dad, I'm so sorry. I didn't want to say that. I can only imagine how you feel and I really apologize. I interrupted her apologies. My tone was cold. It's okay, don't worry, I need to check something in the oven. Behave yourself. She said she loved me and hung up on me. At that moment, I realized that my life was about to change and I needed to act. I started by selling off my assets to reduce my net worth and overcame the fear of returning to society. The following days were filled with tension. I sought legal advice on managing my assets and purchased self-defense insurance in the form of a stun gun to protect myself from possible conflicts with Greg. While Joan was giving birth, I was at work, and my secretary got a call from her husband, Frank, who excitedly informed me that I was now a grandfather. I congratulated him and hurried to the hospital. When I arrived, I found Joan's room and immediately went there. When I got to the door, I heard her talking to Katie. Mom, what you and Dad are doing seems pointless. Do you really want to lose him because of Greg? Katie calmed her down. Don't worry, Joan. His love for me is so strong that he can't even imagine leaving. The bond I share with Greg is truly amazing. It's hard to put into words, but every day with him is like school again, only better when we can be together physically. He treats me like a princess. I've never felt so incredibly close in my life. I will miss him very much when I have to go back to your father. Joan sounded contemptuous. Mom, I don't want to hear about your intimate life with Greg. I know he's a wonderful person and you're perfect for each other. I want my child to have grandparents who are happy together, not separated or constantly fighting. Mom, please, you need to make peace with Dad before it's too late. He may not be as interesting and charming as Greg, but he will always be there for you. Greg may seem like a great find right now, but relationships can change over time. Dad is a reliable and constant person in your life. He won't leave you idle while you do your part. If you have to, swallow your pride and beg him to take you back. Joan continued, pleading with her mother. Mom, please don't wait too long, otherwise you might lose him. Kat's response once again demonstrated her misplaced confidence. You don't have to worry about your father and me. When I'm done with Greg, he'll welcome me back with open arms. Joan chuckled skeptically. I know you think you understand your father, but I've seen him and talked to him. He's changing, and not for the better. He seems bitter and more distant since you left him. Are you really ready to jeopardize your strong 30-year marriage for the sake of a high school sweetheart? Tired of this conversation, I took the opportunity to enter the room and put on a fake smile. 
Hello, dear mother. Congratulations on your son. You must be overjoyed. I went over and hugged Joan, deliberately ignoring Katie. Maybe it was immature, but at that moment it was so much easier for me. Katie looked at me, but Joan looked delighted and asked, Have you seen him yet, Dad? I shook my head. No, honey, I just came to check on you. Unable to stand it, Katie finally spoke in a not-too-pleasant manner. Hi, Tom, how are you? She said sharply. I glanced at her briefly, and then turned my attention to Joan, asking about the birth and the name of the baby. Joan's face lit up, and she happily announced, Frank and I have decided to name our baby Thomas after you, Dad. Upon hearing this, Katie quietly left, saying that she was going to go see the baby. When she left, I took Joan's hands and spoke. Joan, I don't think your mom and I will make up, I said. My words seemed to make a strong impression on her. No, Dad, I don't believe that, she insisted. She'll come to her senses and come home. Tears filled my eyes when I spoke again. Darling, I realized that I was never enough for your mother. Something's going to happen soon, I said. Shock and disbelief showed on Joan's face. What? What is it exactly? What is it? She asked. I forced myself to smile sadly. I will start the divorce process soon after I have settled some things. Her eyes filled with tears as she spoke. Dad, she began. I offered to ask Mom to beg you to forgive her. But it's too late now, isn't it? I silently agreed with her. Yes, I can't forgive her betrayal. Please don't tell her anything yet. She nodded and pulled me to her for a kiss. We continued the conversation, carefully avoiding the topic of Katie and her lover. Promising to return the next day, I left her. When I entered the children's sector, I saw my grandson surrounded by many other kids. I was delighted with how small and precious he looked, and appreciated the beauty of the moment. Frank came up to me with a smile and stood between Katie, Greg, and me. Here, Dad, have a smoke to celebrate, he said. I gratefully accepted the cigar, put it in my pocket, and patted Frank on the back. I'll save it for later, son. Thank you. The sight of my wife and her lover holding hands like teenagers haunted me. Listen, Frank. I'll come tomorrow when there are fewer people around and the air is cleaner if you know what I mean, I said. Frank smiled knowingly. I understand everything, Dad. I don't blame you for anything. When I was about to leave, Kat said softly. Wow, Tom. I can't believe that just yesterday we brought our baby home and now our baby has her own baby. Time really flies too fast. I looked at her, still holding hands with Greg and silently left the room. She looked confused when I left. October came, which turned out to be the best month since Katie left. I went to Vegas with a plan to gamble and lose to reduce our total assets. But the main event of the trip was a meeting with Miranda, a woman in her 50s, who surprised me with her profession and charm. She explained that many men are attracted to older women, and in my case she was absolutely right. Although Miranda was expensive, she brought a new vitality to my life that I hadn't felt in years. In her presence, for the first time since Katie left, I felt like I didn't miss her. Miranda coped with her duties perfectly both in and out of bed, showing genuine curiosity about me, my future ex-wife and her new partner. By the end of the evening, Miranda seemed to know me as well as I knew her. Touched by my story, she gently touched my face before saying goodbye. Tom, even though we've only met recently, I feel the need to tell you something. You are a really good person, a quality that is difficult to find in my experience with numerous men. I can only count a few people that I really like and respect, and you are one of them. Your wife may not realize what she's losing, but don't let her behavior and choices change your character. If you ever come back to the city, please contact me. I will be glad to see you again. After returning from a trip to Vegas, I found myself feeling even more confused than before. Reflecting on our conversations, I began to realize that Miranda was right. Despite the fact that Katie has been a faithful wife and mother for a long time, I could not get rid of the desire for revenge. I was determined not to let this marriage destroy me. 
As soon as I got back, I told my lawyer to start preparing the divorce papers. I also decided to take a deeper look at Greg Hollander's biography. On the advice of a lawyer, I decided to hire a firm that will carefully study his biography from school to the present day. Despite the high cost of the firm's services, I did not hesitate to take up the investigation, because I knew that half of the costs would be covered by Katie's share. Given the firm's reputation for thorough investigation, I was confident that they would provide all the necessary information before the trial. In addition, I suggested to my boss the idea of transferring to one of the branches of our company. Although my boss was surprised by my sudden interest in moving, he promised to explore the possibility and keep me informed. Thanksgiving was coming up, and I knew I was going to have to face it soon. Joan called me a week before the holiday and asked me to join them for dinner. When I asked if her mother and her lover would be there, she reluctantly confirmed that they would be. I politely declined and ended the conversation. To my surprise, Frank then contacted me. He called my office and asked for a meeting. We agreed to meet at one of the bars in the city center for a drink. I couldn't help but notice that Frank looked worried that evening. After exchanging greetings, I ordered us both a double whiskey and sat back to listen to Frank talk about what was going on with my wife and daughter. Dad, you won't believe it, he began. They can't stop talking about him. It's like he's the star of a beer commercial or something. I was amazed by his frankness and began to guess why he was trying to convince me to attend Thanksgiving. I needed to know more, so I asked, So Frank, are you saying that you don't approve of Mr. Hollander? Frank's eyes filled with anger as he replied, Dad, this man is arrogant, self-centered, and selfish. He's so self-absorbed that I don't see a place for Katie in him. When he realized his sudden outburst, his expression changed to one of regret, and he hurriedly retreated. I'm sorry, Dad, I didn't mean to be rude, he said. Smiling, I reassured him. Don't worry, son, I'm not offended. But when did you start calling her Katie instead of Mom? I asked. You looked depressed when she left, he continued. Since then, I have completely lost respect for her, he admitted. Why did her leaving affect you so much? His face turned red with anger again. I'm sure you've all noticed that I never talked about my parents while I was with Joan, and I really appreciate that none of you asked about them. The truth is that my mother cheated on my father, which led to their breakup. My father never recovered and became addicted to alcohol, and my mother tragically died in a car accident with her lover. I have a deep hatred for cheaters, and now that Katie has become one of them, I can no longer be around her. I'm trying to control myself for Joan's sake, but I'm very worried. Before this conversation, I had never heard of Frank's parents and sympathized with his trouble, but at the same time I was interested to know about his concern. Frank, you look worried. What's bothering you? I asked. He took a sip from his glass, ordered another, and then turned to face me. It may upset you, but you asked for it. The idea of both mother and daughter weighs on me. If Katie is cheating on you and bragging about it in front of my wife, then how soon will Joan follow her example? His words made me raise my eyebrows in surprise. I understand your point of view, I replied, joining him and thoughtfully sipping my drink while I considered my next steps. Frank, don't despair. I have a few tricks up my sleeve and I believe that things will change for the better in the coming year. And between you and me, I have plans to make this Christmas special for you and Joan, but not so special for the others if you know what I mean. A smile appeared on Frank's face for the first time since we sat down at the table, and for the next 15 minutes, he tried unsuccessfully to get information out of me. When our meeting came to an end, I smiled at Frank. Are you missing anything? I asked. Frank looked confused. What, Dad? I put my hand on his shoulder. Shouldn't you convince me to act like a man and beg me to come over for Thanksgiving? Frank's smile widened. Oops. Okay, are you coming to Thanksgiving, Dad? I shook my head. No, but I thank you for the invitation. Joan called me twice more before Thanksgiving, begging me to come, but I refused. Listen, Joan, when your mother decided to leave me in June, I told her that we would not communicate for a year, 
She was the one who wanted to end our marriage. I've already broken that rule once to attend Thomas's birth, but I'm not having dinner with them. Do you understand? Thanksgiving came. I was eating frozen dinner feeling lonely and melancholic. But still it's better than watching Katie and Greg exchange glances. December came, bringing with it the approaching family holiday, which I dreaded terribly, but knew that it would be the last one I would have to go through. December was full of surprises. First, the company offered me a position in Spokane, Washington, starting in January, and I gladly accepted. Secondly, the private investigator's report on Mr. Hollander turned out to be very instructive. It said he had a history of infidelity and three ex-wives divorced him because of infidelity. In addition, he had children with other women for whom he paid alimony. In addition, during the divorce, his last wife received half of his pension, and he was demoted in his last year of service in the Corps. His financial and moral reputation looked dubious, if not depressing. The good news was that Katie would receive the divorce papers on the first working day after Christmas. This news filled me with a festive mood. I called Joan to discuss plans for Christmas, and she asked me to arrange a real family meeting again. When I asked about Greg's arrival, Joan got angry. Dad, you have to accept this. He's a member of our family now, whether you approve of him or not. I interrupted her abruptly. You're right, I don't approve. But for the sake of the child, I will be present. Joan looked genuinely happy when she said, Thank you, Dad. It will bring joy to everyone. I had my doubts about that, but I didn't want to spoil the mood. Two days later, when I returned home from work, the phone rang and I answered, Hello? The phone line fell into an awkward silence before a voice broke through. Tom, it's me, Kat. What happened? Kat's voice sounded hesitant. No, I'm fine, Tom. But I just wanted to thank you for agreeing to come over for Christmas. Now I understand how much I offended you. In 30 years, we have never been separated for the holidays. I was so unhappy on Thanksgiving without you. And lately, I've been thinking about us a lot. I interrupted her journey through the paths of memory. Katie, I appreciate your thoughts about our relationship, but I want to remind you that I asked you not to talk to me after our breakup. I made an exception for Christmas, so I think it's better to end this conversation now. Goodbye. After I hung up the phone, I was overwhelmed by a wave of guilt. In the 30 years of our marriage, I had never spoken to her so harshly. But no matter how guilty I felt for my words, it paled in comparison to the pain of the day she left me. The month dragged on slowly, and I had plenty of time for Christmas shopping. I made sure to buy gifts for everyone, packed up for my new job, and rented a car for a trip across the country. When I arrived at the new office, I talked to a helpful woman who picked up several furnished apartments for me next to the office. She even offered to personally show them to me when I arrive in Spokane. Everything was going as well as possible. On Christmas Day in December when I arrived at Joan and Frank's, I found that Katie and her partner were already here. After hugging me warmly and commenting on the surprise, Joan returned to cooking dinner. I couldn't help but smile, knowing that the real surprise was still ahead. Frank greeted me, took my coat, and I asked if I could see my grandson. Frank nodded and said that the child was sleeping in the nursery, but I could still visit him. Quietly entering the nursery, I looked at the sleeping figure in front of me. A surge of emotions overwhelmed me when I realized that my time here was limited and I would not be able to stay for long. I felt a presence behind me. It was Katie, who quietly came and stood next to me. The irony of her absence has weighed on me since June. What a wonderful grandson we have. With a heavy heart, I replied, Yes, Katie, but who will he consider his grandfather me or this fool? Or maybe both? Katie seemed surprised by my question. Why do you say that? You are the only grandfather this child will ever know, she reassured me. I hope you're right, I said, leaving the room. Frank and I talked for the next few hours, and Joan, Katie, and Greg seemed preoccupied with their own thoughts. 
I was saddened by how easily my daughter succumbed to Greg's charm. Frank looked no less displeased, but I comforted him and promised to change the situation this evening. His eyes flashed as he said softly, I hope so, Dad. I can't stand that idiot around her anymore. At this rate, he will soon get closer to Joan. When dinner arrived, the food was delicious, but the atmosphere lacked warmth. Again, I had no desire to talk to either my wife or her companion, and Frank didn't seem to want to talk either. The only interlocutor was Greg, who told women stories about his heroism. I couldn't help feeling anxious watching Greg admire his small audience. After the meal, Joan brought the baby into the living room, and we all gathered together. Looking at my family, I realized that this could be our last moment together. Joan's excitement was palpable as she eagerly instructed Frank to distribute the gifts. Smiling, she handed thoughtful gifts to her mom, Greg, and me. Katie got a cozy sweater, Greg got a gift card, and I got a tie. When Frank, Joan, and the child unwrapped the gifts from Katie and Greg, Joan was beaming with joy, and Frank looked polite and distant. When all the presents were opened, there was silence in the room, and all attention turned to me and my pile of gifts. Breaking the silence, I said, At the end of this amazing weekend, I want to give you the gifts you deserve for this holiday. Standing up, I picked up the package I had brought with me and handed Frank and Joan a large envelope wrapped in colorful paper. Joan excitedly opened the bag while Frank looked at her. Her joyful exclamation filled the room when she saw the contents of the envelope. Joan quickly said, Mom, Dad gave us your house without a mortgage. We will finally be able to move out of this rented accommodation. Isn't that wonderful? Katie's face showed concern as she turned to me and asked, Why did you make that decision, Tom? Where are we going to live? I gave her a determined look, trying to express my emotions. Don't worry, Katie. I've thought of everything, and this is for you. I watched her excitement when she opened the package and found a bracelet inside. When she took the bracelet out of the box, her expression changed to one of surprise, and I offered it to her. Look at the inscription. I personally wrote it. I noticed that Greg was unhappy with the gift, so Katie turned the bracelet over and found the inscription. Thank you for the best 30 years of my life, Tom. Greg frowned, and Katie looked confused. Tom, thank you very much, it's wonderful. But you forgot to write with love, she said. I smiled back. I haven't forgotten, Katie. I made a conscious decision not to cheat on you. Over time, my feelings for you have weakened. You will receive the divorce papers on Monday. Joan sighed as Katie's expression turned to shock and sadness. Pointing to the postcard on the table, I added, I tried to express appreciation for the good times we had together and for our daughter. I also attached a check for half of our liquid assets. Although it's not much, $195 have been spent during your absence. The house is meant for my daughter after you left our marriage. Turning to Greg, I felt the storm coming. This gift is for you too, I said, handing Katie another envelope. When she opened it, she seemed shocked to find in it detailed information about what her lover had been doing after their breakup at school. I think you'll be intrigued by this. Before I could finish, Greg exploded in anger and started threatening me. I will destroy you, despicable creature! I shouted to Greg as I watched him collapse to the ground after my taser hit him with a loud thud. Joan and Katie got to their feet and I tasered Greg twice more. Approaching him, I mockingly said, Do you feel the agony? It's nothing compared to the pain of losing the woman I've loved for three decades to someone as vile as you. Katie sobbed, as if her world was collapsing around her, and I turned to her. I may not be as exciting as your sergeant, but I will not forget your betrayal, I said, striking another blow and enjoying his convulsions. I turned to Katie plucking up more courage than my broken heart could handle. Since you seem to like this situation, I have a special gift for you, Katie. Freedom. Now you can live in luxury during the day and have fun at night. It's decent for a traitor like you, don't you think? 
Katie tried to speak, but she managed to whisper, No, this shouldn't have happened. I was supposed to come back to you in June, Tom. I love you. Joan hurried to comfort her, and I took one last look at Greg before Frank nervously intervened. Dad, you don't have to do this again. You can ruin him, he warned. Standing over the defeated enemy, I looked at the two women who meant everything to me. I'm going to go. Thank you for a wonderful day and a wonderful life. Most likely, we will not see each other again. Perhaps never. Both women were silent, looking at me as if I were a stranger. Frank handed me the coat with a smug smile. As I was about to leave, I turned to my daughter, who for the first time looked at me with fear in her eyes. Joan, remember this moment. If you continue on the same path as your mother, you will face the same difficulties as she did. You will lose everything, your husband, your home, your possessions, and the love of your life. I went over to little Tom's crib, gently touched his cheek and whispered, maybe we'll meet again someday, but I doubt it. With a smile on my face, I headed for the door and wished them, happy new year to everyone. As I walked to my car, I imagined how shocked I was that the women had left and Greg had come to his senses. I distinctly heard a desperate voice shouting, No, this can't be happening to me. I started the engine and thought about the upcoming trip to Spokane via Vegas, looking forward to seeing Miranda again. As I was pulling out of the driveway, Frank appeared in the window, smiling and waving. I reciprocated his feelings and then went to a new life in the West. A year has passed since I left, and Katie's life has changed dramatically. Greg, like his future wives, left Katie and disappeared. Kit had nowhere to go. She desperately asked Joan and Frank to give her shelter in their house, but Frank was categorically against it. He didn't want Katie to be a bad influence on his family. He noticed how often Katie changed men during this year. There were even rumors that Katie was engaged in intimacy in the toilet of the bra with the first person she met. I often talk on the phone with Frank. He replaced my family for me because only he understood how much pain Katie and Joan caused me. He said that when Katie had nowhere to go, she had to rent a small apartment. One day, Katie came to the house of Frack and Joan in a state of drunkenness. But it was not intoxication from alcohol. Katie demanded to see her grandson. But when Joan realized what her mother had turned into, she drove her away and said she no longer wanted to see Katie. Since then, nothing is known about Katie, and no one knows if she is alive or not. I hope she's learned her lesson for the rest of her life. On a whim, I decided to run from the office to the house, a distance of about two miles. I received some unfinished work materials, which upset me, so I quickly changed into more comfortable clothes and went for an impromptu run. I changed out of jeans and a work shirt for shorts, a t-shirt and sneakers, put on sunglasses and a headband, and then hit the road. My goal was to pick up several newspapers from home, about 20 pages in total. As I approached my house, which was about half a mile away, I noticed a man 200 yards ahead of me. It seemed strange to me because this path usually led only to my house and was rarely used by other people. The path ended at a cliff that led to the back of my house, and it was possible to assume that the man standing in front of me was heading straight for him. Quickening my pace, I rounded the corner and saw a man standing at the back door to my patio. I watched in disbelief as he easily opened the unlocked door. As I stopped to think about what I had just witnessed, I remembered that my wife Alice was working at home that day. Without hesitation, I hurried to the door, but found it locked. With a sense of urgency, I took out the key and quickly unlocked the door. I quietly opened the door to the patio and looked inside. The kitchen where Alice usually worked was empty, except for scattered documents and a laptop on the table. A faint noise coming from above caught my attention. I carefully picked up the baton I was holding at the entrance from the dining room to the kitchen. It resembled those used by government officials. This baton once belonged to my grandfather when he worked as a patrol policeman. It was a symbol of protection, but for me it also held memories of the man I idolized as a child. Holding the baton in my hand, 
I silently headed upstairs. The carpeted floor muffled my footsteps, allowing me to approach the closed door of the master bedroom, from where muffled sounds came. I hesitated for a moment, deciding that they were intimate in nature. Taking a deep breath, I took hold of the door handle and slowly pushed it open. When I entered the room, I was shocked to find the clothes of a runner scattered on the floor, who was going to climb on top of my completely undressed wife. Without hesitation, I went to the bed and hit the guy on the ass with a baton, causing a loud slap. He cried out in pain and quickly moved away from Alice. She stared at me with wide eyes, arms, legs, and eyes outstretched. She shouted something and I realized that this guy was actually her boss, Simon Green. He quickly got off the bed and stood up, looking confused and taken by surprise. Stop it, I stuttered. I was invited, Simon said. I looked at Alice, but she was silent. Simon, towering over me and radiating confidence, warned, You better put this back, otherwise I'll take it from you and kick your ass. He was older and bigger than me. He was in his 40s and I was in my 30s. There were rumors that he was proficient in martial arts. Standing naked in my bedroom with pale skin, he was waiting for me as a stranger, and I was waiting for him. He didn't know that I spent a lot of time playing tennis and have impressive backhand skills. When I smiled at him, it should have caused a violent reaction in him. With a roar like a wild beast, he charged at me from about six feet away. I swiftly delivered a powerful blow to his face, catching him off guard as he did not have time to react. The blow landed not on his cheek, but on the right side of his forehead, perhaps because he tried to dodge my blow by slightly tilting his head down. Therefore, the baton hit him in the forehead, causing him to collapse like a bag of bricks. He remained motionless while I looked down at him. Glancing at Alice, I noticed that she was about to start to freeze. Her eyes were glazed, and saliva was running down her chin. My gaze wandered around the room and stopped at the mobile phone lying on the dresser and pointing the screen at the bed. It became obvious that this man had recorded everything that was happening. I picked up the phone, unlocked it, and looked at the call log, and he dialed 911. What happened to you? My name is Tim Jenkins. I'm at my house at 12 Arbor Circle. This man was in my house in my bedroom. When he attacked me, I hid him. I believe he is seriously injured and needs immediate medical attention. Besides, my wife is here and I think she's here, I don't know, under the influence of drugs or something like that. She's conscious, but she's not responding. Sir, help is on its way to you. If you are armed, we ask you to put down your weapon. Our team will approach your home with caution for the sake of everyone's safety. We are grateful for your cooperation. I'll be waiting for them in the front yard. When I heard the sirens, I quickly went downstairs, keeping the phone line open. Putting the baton on the sofa, I went outside and stood in the yard with my hands on my hips. When a police car pulled up, followed by an ambulance, I saw two policemen get out of it, a man and a woman. They got out of the car, but did not take out their weapons. The woman, who expected to see a higher rank, asked, Are you Mr. Jenkins? Yes, they're up there. Show us out. I turned around and went back into the house. The officers followed me. I led them to the bedroom door and stepped aside. The door was open. Alice was lying on the bed. She was staring into space. Green didn't move and it was noticeable. The female officer knelt down next to Green and checked his pulse. Instructing another officer to call an ambulance, she turned her attention to Alice. Ma'am, are you okay? What happened? What is it? She asked, but got no answer. The doctors arrived quickly and began to work decisively on Alice. Soon they were joined by a second group of doctors. Then Police Sergeant Leslie Haddon intervened, who took the robe off the closet door and helped Alice put it on. After escorting Alice to the guest bedroom, she motioned for me to follow her. Go there, but try not to interfere, she instructed me. Following the order, I entered the kitchen and looked around the room. Grabbing Green's cell phone, I transferred the video to a small computer hidden in a desk drawer. After saving the contents of the phone to a separate file, 
I sent the video to my office by email. Turning off the computer I left the phone on Alice's desk and watched from the kitchen as the ambulance crew carried Green out of the house. He was quickly loaded into a car and taken away. The policewoman, whom I didn't recognize, directed Alice into the living room, out of my sight. Alice followed her without taking her eyes off the floor. She was wearing a bathrobe and sneakers. Sergeant Haddon entered the kitchen with plainclothes Detective John Dempster, an elderly and slender man. She introduced him to me, even though we already knew each other. I was mainly involved in civil matters. I had been involved in criminal defense for some time when Detective Dempster and I started working on several cases together. He seemed pleasant to me, and we established a good understanding. Hi, Tim. I'm really sorry about what happened. Do you know the man who was hit? Yes, this is my wife's boss, Simon Green, I replied to him. Do you have any information about where he lives? We have his stuff, but no ID, Detective Dempster asked. I hardly know him, John, I confessed. As far as I know, he was married, the children were in school, and that was about a year ago. Do you suspect that he had an intimate relationship with your wife? So far, no one has told me anything about it. Can you explain to me how this situation developed? I talked about everything, starting with how I decided to go for a run to relieve stress and pick up documents, and ending with a 911 call. I didn't miss a single detail, and I didn't have any motives for doing so. Did you see Green when you were outside? No, I only recognized him when he got out of bed. I ended up kicking his ass. I didn't want to hurt him. I just wanted to protect my wife. He told me to drop the baton, otherwise he would use it to beat me up, so I hit him again when he lunged at me. He even let out a roar before attacking me. I realized that he was trying to intimidate me, and unfortunately he succeeded. Despite my intention to aim lower, he apparently shifted or tilted, as a result of which I missed the target. Despite this, he assured me that his wife was not involved in what was happening and that they were only checking her for the presence of psychoactive substances. I assumed that as soon as she came to her senses, she would confirm his words. Continuing the conversation, I mentioned that the cell phone belongs to Green and that there may be a video recording of this meeting on it. Why is he downstairs? I used it to call the rescue service and then left it open when I went outside to wait. Dempster asked the crime scene technician to open the phone. I asked how Alice was feeling. I'm not sure, he replied. Let's go check on her. The sergeant, Dempster, and I entered the living room, where Alice was sitting in the company of a uniformed officer and a medic. Dempster asked the doctor, What happened to Mrs. Jenkins? The doctor explained, We're taking her to the county hospital as a precaution because she seems to be in shock. Alice's vital signs were stable. When I looked at her, she met my gaze, and a tear flowed from her right eye. I'm so sorry, Timmy, she whispered, before slipping back into unconsciousness. I called her, but she didn't answer. Soon she was taken away by ambulance. I quickly changed into fresh clothes and followed her into our car. The police were at the house, but I was told that they would cordon it off before leaving. I contacted Alice's parents, who lived in another state about two hours away, and briefly explained the situation to them. I promised to tell them the news from the hospital. Alice and I tied the knot when she was only 21, right after we met in college. At that time, I had almost graduated from law school. Alice quickly found a job at Simon Green's insurance company, where he was one of three owners of a large enterprise. Gradually, she moved up the career ladder, working her way up from a clerk to an administrative assistant. She was hired by Green's department, which dealt with housing and cars. I accompanied her to corporate events and never suspected that there was anything between them. It was the first time I was introduced to the Green family. She has been working for the company for more than six years. Until today, I thought our marriage was solid. I had no reason to believe that the relationship I witnessed was not consensual, unless he somehow manipulated her or drugged her. This situation is likely to lead to the breakup of our marriage. I couldn't understand how he could have drugged her given the circumstances. I assumed she was waiting for him, probably naked, and left the back door open. 
I was wondering how often this had happened before. I adored Alice. She was beautiful, happy and caring. Our intimacy was complete. Even when I was busy we found time for each other, especially on weekends. Since I practically stopped conducting criminal trials, my work has become more routine. I couldn't understand what I was witnessing. Green turned out to be a big man. But on closer inspection, it could be assumed that its size would not have a significant impact on the situation. However, I only glanced at him briefly. Later, Simon Green's wife appeared in the hospital waiting room. I recognized her but she didn't seem to recognize me. I left it as it was, and asked about Alice. I was allowed to go to the room where she was staying. When she was asleep, I couldn't help but look at her, feeling completely lost. I was trying to come to terms with the fact that she had caused us both such pain. Before making any decisions, I needed to understand what had happened. Suddenly, a beautiful woman in a white robe entered the room. I'm Dr. Moore and you're her husband, she said. I nodded silently. What's wrong with her? I asked. The doctor explained that she had suffered some kind of mental trauma that led to a shock reaction, which caused her to lose consciousness. She didn't go into a daze. Most likely when she wakes up she will come to her senses and return to normal life. How soon will she wake up? It can take anywhere from three to four hours, depending on the dose administered. Thanks, I'll be there, I promise. Good. When she was about to leave, I stopped her. What about Simon Green? How is he doing? Do you know him? No, we just know each other. I probably shouldn't tell you, but he's in a coma right now. He was on medication when he talked about his serious head injury. She left the room. I couldn't stop thinking about Green and began to believe that I was to blame for his condition. But now I'm not sure about that. I contacted Alice's parents and told them about the situation. They were going to come to us, but I convinced them not to do it. Instead, I told them that Alice might have had an intimate relationship with her boss and that we needed to talk about it. She's been on my mind for the last few months. She seemed to be in a different state, in anxiety. Tim, please give her a chance to clarify everything. I assure you, I will do so. But as expected, it won't change anything. We'll have to wait and see. I tracked down Mrs. Green and found her in the waiting room of the intensive care unit. I went up to her and greeted her. Hello, Mrs. Green. Can I talk to you? Yes. Do you want to say something? She replied. No, ma'am. I'm Tim Jenkins. My wife Alice works for your husband's company. They seem to be in a relationship. The woman was tall, slender, with brown hair, and looked to be about 30 years old. She asked, Together? Yes, they were undressed in my bedroom when I got home this morning, that's the closeness. Oh, so you're the guy who hit him. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. The woman admitted this, and mentioned that Simon had been acting strangely lately which made her think about changing his behavior, for example, that he did not participate in children's sports events as before. He said he was busy with work. I suspect he was busy with your wife. I can't say for sure except for today. But they wasted no time and expected to have a routine. What did the doctors say about his condition? They didn't give a clear answer. He may have surgery soon. I wish you good luck. Will you take the children with you? They're with my parents. They know he's in the hospital. I went outside to get some fresh air and clear my head a little. I decided not to make any decisions until I hear from Alice. I stood there for an hour and returned to the room. Alice was in the same waiting room behind the curtain. I went into her. She stirred, but she was still asleep. I sat down in an armchair and dozed off. I woke up when she started to sniff pitifully. Oh, uh, she muttered, opening her eyes. She looked at me and closed them again, letting out a soft moan. I rushed to get help and found Dr. Moore in the infirmary. I motioned for her to come quickly. She seems to be coming too, but I'm not sure I should be here when she wakes up, I explained. When Dr. Moore came over, she saw me and fainted again. Please wait here. Dr. Moore ordered as he entered the room. 
I strained to hear their conversation but I couldn't see what was going on inside. How are you feeling Alice? Dr. Moore's voice asked. Alice replied in a weak voice, I'm really sorry, really God. She was urged to fully wake up and accept the situation in order to move on. She was given to understand that detachment cannot last long. She was informed that she would be released in the afternoon, possibly within two hours. Alice asked about my whereabouts, mentioning that I was there when she first came to her senses. The doctor explained that I left because I thought she would feel better without me. Although he's somewhere nearby. I wonder how long this will last. I totally screwed up. What about Simon? Is he alright? Tim hit him. We don't know if he's going to be okay or not. Most likely he will have to have surgery. Damn it. Well, I told him not to be such an adventurer. It was a bad risk. He lost. I'm sure I am too. Maybe you should talk to Tim. I'm sure I can find him. Maybe it can wait until you get home. I pulled back the curtain and entered the room. Alice, I'll give you a ride home, I offered. I hope we leave soon. Okay, thanks, Alice replied. I'm really sorry, she added. We'll talk, I assured her, and turned to Dr. Moore. When can we leave? I'm going to start filling out the necessary paperwork right now, Dr. Moore replied. She's going to change her clothes now. As Dr. Moore was leaving, Alice spoke up. I want to apologize, Timmy. It's not that important. We'll go home when Dr. Moore gives us a medical form. I left the room while she was changing. She was expected to take it as a rejection. And so it was. I didn't want to see her naked, probably never again. They put her in a wheelchair while I drove the car to the exit. She got up and got into the car. We didn't exchange a single word during the 10-minute drive. Tears were streaming down her face, but she wasn't crying. I unlocked the front door. We entered our once joyful abode without finding any traces of the police or any significant disorder below. Alice settled into a rocking chair in the living room and I went upstairs. When I went up to the top floor, I found a chaotic picture. Our bedroom was a mess, and there was a cutout piece of green carpet on the floor. Having decided to get to the truth, I began further investigation. The bed was taken apart, all the drawers were pulled out, and I was puzzled and alarmed by what had happened in our house. I decided to leave everything in a mess for now, planning to clean up later. The rest of the rooms were in good condition, except for fingerprints and powder in the bathroom. I wasn't particularly excited about talking to Alice. I called her parents to let them know that she had returned home. They were thrilled, but didn't know if they should come. I didn't have an answer for them. I gritted my teeth and headed downstairs. Can I get you anything? Coffee? Water? I asked Alice. She looked at me and just replied, No. I sat down opposite her on the sofa. We were positioned about six feet apart from each other. I asked, What's going on, Alice? I thought everything was fine between us. She hesitated before answering, it's complicated, Timmy. I've been working for Simon for many years and have always admired him, but recently he started flirting with me. He made obsessive comments about my appearance and even touched my arm or shoulder. It took me by surprise. Then he invited me to lunch. But didn't you think about all this, about this big change in attitude? And didn't it seem strange to you, maybe a little? She lowered her eyes. I was flattered and he's quite attractive. I was curious. It took me a while to admit it. So you knew he was trying to seduce you, and what did you decide? Let's see what happens. She lowered her head into her hands, but then looked up again. And then what? At that moment, I was sure that we had problems, because she was not deceived and was not hooked on drugs. She wanted it herself. We went to dinner. I asked him why he decided to show his feelings now after all this time. He explained that he had always felt me from the very beginning, but had hidden it. Those were his exact words. Alice, why? What is there about me that made you accept this? Timmy, it's okay. He expressed his strong desire for me, claiming that he wanted me more than anyone else. I was ordinary to you, but new and exciting to him. That thought alone turned me on. 
Why didn't you discuss this with me? How could I admit that I was thinking about infidelity? I never thought about it for the excitement. How many times have you had intimacy, Alice? Not once. Today was supposed to be the first and only time, but then you showed up. I was scared when I saw you. Your expression was cold and indifferent after you beat him up. You looked at me with contempt, but not with anger or hatred. It's like nothing has changed. It was a short moment before you hit him with a baton. I thought the police should have questioned me first when I spoke up. To hell with them! I had no choice but to act. He rushed towards me. I watched it all in one swift and decisive moment. Alice. It's hard to believe that this is the first time I've seen him come in through the back door. The door was unlocked, which allowed me to quickly get inside and go upstairs. There I found you both naked, and he was inches away from making love to you. It was obvious that you were both ready to participate in this. It doesn't seem like this is the first time you've done this kind of thing. No, Tim. Simon and I kissed in his car just two days ago. We tried our hand, but I didn't let it go any further. I informed him that he can visit our house as soon as you leave for work. It all seems incredible. If you saw what I saw, what would you believe? You have to believe me, or maybe you don't. I do not know how to make you believe what I am saying. And now, I will never be able to trust your words. What should I do? Tim, I care about you. I have no sympathy for Simon. His strength and assertiveness fueled my desire. It was clear that he wanted me, as I wanted him. Alice, I need time to think about our situation. If we act according to our desires now, it will only lead us to divorce. The picture of what I witnessed is etched in my memory. Please know that I love you despite the pain you're going through. She confessed through tears. Turning away, I headed upstairs to my home office. Looking through the contents of Green's phone, I found that over the past two months, Alice's phone had received a lot of calls, and all of them were evening calls. Green wasn't supposed to call her during office hours. There were also text messages discussing the lunch arrangement, and according to them, they had been meeting for lunch twice a week for the past five weeks. Considering that Alice worked from home three days a week, it turned out that she met with Green every day when she came to the office. She had lunch with Green. I decided to watch his video. It all started when he followed Alice up the stairs. She was wearing a short robe. She entered the bedroom and immediately knocked him to the floor. The video was interrupted for a second when he put the phone on the dresser and pointed to the bed. You're beautiful, Alice. That's exactly how I've always imagined you. Thanks, Sai. She sat down on the bed. He took off his shorts and shirt. He was excited. Right now, I only want you, he said decisively. Alice lay on her back and waited impatiently for him. Come on, I'm ready for this, she urged. He jumped on the bed, but before he could do anything, I intervened by opening the door and hitting him. The sound of the impact was pleasant and accompanied by his cries of pain. I continued to watch what was happening until I finally dialed the emergency number. After watching the video... I was skeptical that Alice was telling the truth about this being their first time. She was expected to be looking forward to an intimate moment with Green. Despite her statement that it could only happen once, I doubted it. Considering that he was her boss, it was hard for me to believe that this could be an isolated incident. I left and informed Alice that I needed to get back to work to finish closing the office. By that time, it was already late in the evening, so I quickly ran back. I didn't give a damn about Alice's feelings anymore. Instead of feeling depressed, I was overcome with anger. I quit my business and went for a run, and thoughts of divorce were spinning in my head. I studied the laws of our state and found that adultery is a good reason for divorce, although it is rarely mentioned. No one was to blame for this situation. If, after six months of separation, we signed an agreement on the division of property, then we could proceed to divorce. But if one of us refused to sign the agreement, the process was delayed. Maybe for 18 months. I was unsure whether to end my marriage with Alice, but I was sure that a divorce was necessary. 
I have carefully prepared an agreement in which I set out the terms of separation. We will live separately, share finances, and everyone will take care of themselves. The agreement also stipulated that there would be no intimate relationship between us. The most important thing is that we both promise to comply with these conditions. We should not engage in intimate relationships with other people. This will allow you to let the other person go, which will lead to a quick divorce. I made three copies of the contract and left. When I got home, Alice was in the kitchen cooking dinner. There was only a small amount of spaghetti with meat sauce and salad. She was wearing a tracksuit, no makeup, and barefoot. She looked at me timidly when I entered. It smells delicious, I commented. Thank you, she replied. Can I help you with something? I offered. No, I'll manage on my own, she said. But if you want carrots in the salad, we have some. The carrots I sliced were in the fridge, ready to eat. We sat down to eat in silence, each with his own glass of red wine in his hand. After finishing the meal, we put the dishes away together and went into the living room to talk. I noticed that Alice looked scared and followed her inside. She spoke softly, apologizing again. Tim, I just want to say that I'm really sorry, she said. It's hard for me to realize how wrong I was. I realized that I should seek help. Everything is fine, but I think it would be better for us to end our relationship. I'll be looking for a place nearby to move in. You can stay here. I don't want to stay in this house anymore. Are you sure about this decision? I am overwhelmed with guilt. Maybe we should think about getting a divorce. Maybe it's time for us to go our separate ways. I think it's the right decision, although I'm still not sure about it. Realizing that I needed to be alone to reflect, I drew up a divorce agreement and gave it to Alice. When she read it, tears welled up in her eyes. She looked up at me and asked if we could postpone the process so that mom would be with her. I agreed to wait a little longer. Alice then expressed her intention to seek advice, emphasizing the sincerity of her words. You may be able to attend if the consultant requires your presence. Maybe. Alice, you are very dear to me, but I feel confused and incredibly angry. It looks like things will never be the same again. I feel the same way. What you did changed everything. The person I thought you were wasn't really that person. The fact that you were caught only makes the betrayal worse. You're still the same, but not the one I fell in love with. When Alice started crying, I remained indifferent, unable to comfort her. The woman I once loved would never behave like that. You're not her. Maybe you look like her in some ways, but I can't be sure. It seems to me that our whole relationship was a lie. The question is, how much? I went upstairs, packed my things from the master bedroom to last until the next day, and moved into the guest room. The next day was a work day, and I hardly slept. I woke up early, packed my things, and went to work. Around nine in the morning, I left the house and bought a cupcake. I found myself unexpectedly productive at work. I sent a lot of emails and decrypted notes in the judge's office. Deep in my business, I forgot about Alice for a moment. Perhaps this is the mindset I need to adopt during our breakup. During lunch, I studied the information about apartment rentals and scheduled a viewing of one of them, located just two blocks from my workplace, the next morning. The day passed quickly, and on reflection, I realized that my busy schedule might have been a way to distract myself from the current situation. I started walking home at about 5.30 p.m. We rented a three-bedroom house. The lease was due to expire in two months. We lived there for four years, and this place became practically our home. But now it's not for me anymore. I got off the treadmill and went through the sliding back door just like the day before. Alice was cooking. There was a stewed fish on the stove. It smelled wonderful. She was a very good cook. I felt good. I greeted her when I entered the house. I looked at her while she was cooking fish stew. I smiled back at her. Thank you, she said. I'm going to rearrange it now. While we were enjoying the meal, Alice mentioned that her mom was coming on Saturday. She asked if I had already found a place to live. Maybe, I replied. 
Tomorrow I will inspect the apartment. We will be able to sign the lease agreement in the evening. I informed her that I would not be home on Saturday. It doesn't have to be like this, Tim, she pleaded. I promise it won't happen again. No, I replied firmly. Obviously promises are often not kept. She was looking at me. Her expression was serious. There were no tears in her eyes. You're letting your resentments cloud your judgment, she said. What is the best thing for me to do? Should I ignore your betrayal? I can't do that, even if you want to try to make amends. It's worth trying to forgive instead. She asked for forgiveness, but I wasn't sure if I could really forgive her. One thing I know for sure, I will never be able to forget what you did. What I saw, the video, I can send you a copy by email. God, Tim. She began to sob. I didn't want it to hurt. Just so you know what I saw. Maybe someday you'll forgive me for interrupting you. She ran away, ran up the stairs. I've cleaned everything up. I rented an apartment. It was a studio apartment with a wonderful view of the jogging track and a small park. She was halfway between work and my former home. The room was empty. There was no furniture. I have arranged for the delivery of a double bed, sofas, and armchairs. It was expensive, but necessary for comfort. I was wondering if Alice would work in the future or if she would need additional financial support. Sitting after lunch, I thought about various topics. I've come to the conclusion that I probably don't love Alice anymore. But I had a friend who worked for the same company as her. Michelle Davis and I were college classmates and were in a relationship before I met Alice. I broke up with her when I started dating Alice, and she started dating a frat boy. Despite our past, we remained friends and kept in touch. I remember it seemed to me that Michelle was a little impulsive, especially when she quickly started a relationship with a frat boy. But soon she was done with him. Michelle studied law with me and eventually married her classmate. Now she has a little son. Apparently it was a strong marriage, which proves my ability to read people. When I called her, Michelle answered, surprised that I could hear her. Tim, she said, how are you? I mentioned the incident with Green, saying it was self-defense. Then Michelle invited me to lunch, which I agreed to. The restaurant was a few minutes away from home, where we greeted each other, hugged and sat down at the table to make an order. While we were waiting for food, Michelle asked me to tell her side of the story, which I did. She was someone I trusted. I found that I still trusted her. When I finished my story, she said, I've heard rumors about Simon Green, that he's gone off the rails and is probably going to get a divorce. I also heard that Alice is dating him. I didn't believe it. What did you hear? What did you see? For example, lunch, office meetings, everything else is guesswork. Nevertheless, it seemed strange to me that I began to see Green more often than usual. He seemed to be constantly looking for someone to sleep with. The girls from the office were overjoyed. Hmm, so Alice wasn't the only one? Maybe not, but it was expected that she was the main target. They saw each other every day. No offense, but why didn't you call me? I thought about it, but I decided that she wouldn't do anything, and calling you could cause a lot of trouble. What are you going to do? I rented an apartment and drew up a separation agreement for six months, but I'm not sure about the current situation. I hope you'll take her point of view into account. What else can she say? She has already apologized and promised not to repeat her actions. But is it enough? This is a difficult decision. By the way, how are you Big Bill and Little Will? Little Will is doing well at the age of three, full of energy and enthusiasm. Soon he will start going to kindergarten. And you? Tim, you don't need to hear about my problems. Yours are much more serious. I'm here to help if you need me. I could use a break from them. He has to travel a lot. Sometimes when he returns home he becomes different, not the same as before. Now that I've heard about Billy, it's got me thinking. But I've just decided to take active action. Michelle, what does this mean? Could you tell me more about it? He's a good guy. We are one family, but I need a little bit of confidence. Just ask him. Talk to him. You both know how to talk. Find out everything. Tell him how you feel. 
I'm worried about it. He may take it as something that I don't trust him. And you just be gently diplomatic. Maybe. Thanks. I hope you and Alice can handle this. I was never her friend at school. You know why. But I thought she was right for you after all. After finishing lunch, we exchanged hugs and said goodbye. Michelle was a kind girl, and I hoped nothing bad would happen to her. I found out that Alice had returned to work, and I was glad that she hadn't been fired. Over time, I began to realize that my relationship with Alice was really over. We were devoted only to each other, and there was no question of any children. She didn't fulfill her part of the commitments she made, and it became clear that this was the end for us. I didn't think I was ready to start over with a clean slate, with new responsibilities. The denouement was disappointing, but I knew it was necessary. I haven't spoken to Alice at all since I moved in with her on Saturday. It's been a week now, and she's left three voicemails urging me to come and talk. Despite her messages that she was on probation at work, I still did not respond. The following Saturday afternoon, I passed by her house and decided to look into the situation. I went to the patio door and knocked, not knowing what would happen next. Alice's mother, Tess, was in the kitchen when she saw me and opened the door. Hi, Tess. Is Alice here? I asked. She's not here, but she'll be back soon, Tess replied. Tim, she feels very uncomfortable about all this. Have you made a decision yet? I explained that I just wanted to talk to Alice. Where did she go? I asked. Tess was predictably awkward and hesitated before saying, she went to see a friend. I realized that she was hiding something from me. Tess, you're not very good at lying. Which friend did she go to? Did she spend the night here or somewhere else? Tim, she was in a bad way. A partner came and they went to have a snack. Tess, was that last night's dinner? You can't hide it from me. I noticed that she positioned herself so as to block the door from the kitchen. I walked past her to the front door. A car pulled up. A brand new Mustang. A blonde man was driving. He got out of his door and walked around the car to open the passenger door. Alice went out. She was dressed for a date. For yesterday's date. I ran up to them. Hi Alice, I came to see you. She turned around in shock. The guy looked scared and worried. Timmy, I am... This is James from work. He... You were at his place last night? I was calm, but something in my voice must have scared them both. James began to move away from the side. Dude, I don't want any trouble, he muttered, trying to defuse the situation. I was just trying to be helpful. That's a lie. You got exactly what you wanted. If you stay here a little longer, you'll get more than you expected. He was younger and the same height as me. I saw him straighten up and look offended. Alice screamed, begging him, James, please leave. James replied, Whatever you say, Alice, the emphasis is on you. I chuckled. She's giving you a chance to leave gracefully, asshole. Use it. He laughed, quickly got into the car and drove away. I turned to Alice. That's all you can do. You didn't last a week. The contract says, no attraction. I will refer to this point. I will arrange for the papers to be handed over to you as soon as they are ready. I'm sorry, Tim. I'm weak, and I needed support. And I knew that you and I had broken up. But I love you, even if I don't deserve it. I think you just need a new kind of love to get the thrill that you missed last week. How loose you've become. We don't need to keep in touch anymore. Hire a lawyer. I went out, walked along the path, and headed home. It was an obvious choice for her, but it took me by surprise. We've been together for a while now, but she's never acted like this before. She was beautiful, and it was no wonder that men paid attention to her. I couldn't understand why she had suddenly succumbed to their advances. When I got to my room, I accepted that she would always be a mystery to me. Maybe I'll turn to her mother for answers. I had a rare opportunity to talk to Tess alone. It's been about a week since my last visit, and I managed to sneak into the house while Alice was probably at work. I knocked on the terrace door, and Tess let me in. Why are you here, Tim? What's the matter? What is it? She asked. I wanted to find out what happened between us, and I thought you might know something. 
We were doing well, and then she suddenly changed. Do you know why? I asked. Maybe, she replied. I think she had self-esteem issues. In high school, Alice didn't attract the attention of many boys. She lacked curves and had a slim figure, while her two friends quickly blossomed and became popular cheerleaders. Alice found herself falling behind in the popularity race, and her friends were moving away from her. But everything changed when she turned 17. Suddenly, she got fat in all the right places, and her pimples disappeared, attracting the attention of guys who hadn't paid attention to her before. She went to prom with a football player and lost her virginity. She was 18. She was working that summer, but every night she went on dates with her friends and boyfriends. I was afraid she would get pregnant, but she was taking pills. I was worried about the disease, but as far as I know, this did not happen. I said that when we met in college in our freshman year, she didn't look like a loose girl. She always seemed normal to me, but she had more experience than me. She told me what she likes and what she wants. I liked it, but since we started dating, she has never lost her way. Still, Tess paused and asked me, Did you talk about children? Yes, we were going to have them soon, and now it's all gone. Well, maybe she was afraid that if she got pregnant, men would stop liking her. I think she contacted her boss because he was stalking her and she needed guarantees. That's the best I can guess. What about the guy with the Mustang? A young man with a fancy car for the same reason. He wanted to prove that she was still desirable to him, but deep down she knew that the marriage would not last long and there would be no children together. Maybe she just felt lonely. How long will you be here? I asked. Not for long, she replied. I wish you all the best, Tess, I said as I left. The divorce was finalized without any problems and Alice moved out of our rented apartment. After the trial, she moved to a new apartment closer to her job on the other side of the city, cutting off all contact with me. When it was time to file for divorce, I suddenly bumped into Alice in the hallway. Invite me to lunch, Tim. I have something to say. Good. We went to the Red Lobster. I ate the snack, and she ate the soup. She looked at me when we placed the order. Tim, I really ruined your life. I went to a psychologist. She said I was afraid of children, but I didn't know. I think maybe I was just born a fallen woman. I really wanted Simon to make love to me. I'm really sorry. I'll probably never understand, Alice. He's not that much of a ladies' man. What happened to him? He didn't die, and I didn't hear anything else. He returned to work part-time. He walks with a cane and hardly uses his right hand and his wife divorced him. Good for her. I think it was cruel. You really ruined his life, Tim. And you too ruined my life. I guess not as much as you ruined your own life. By the way, how are you doing? Now I can make love as much as I want with most of the men I meet. And I really like it. I'm getting very hot and passionate. When this happens, I have to do something about it. I do not know why this started happening to me again. Simon reminded me of the guy who invited me to prom and then took my virginity. Maybe I wanted to go back to those glorious days. You can engage in intimacy for your own pleasure, don't be cruel. But she laughed. I really didn't want it to be funny, but I understood the humor and laughed with her. She said, A new man always turns me on. She paused. Anyway, I really miss you in family life. I haven't found a single guy who's better than you in bed. Maybe one was just as good. It's bigger. But you and I got to know each other so well. You could always satisfy me very much. I was a fool. I admit right away our conversation about her promiscuous behavior made me tense up. I didn't try to hide it from her, and she noticed it. I see you still find me attractive, Tim. I'm available to you at any time. She started humming this song. Just say my name and you know wherever I am. I will come running to see you again. She smiled at me. Oh, Alice, my God. I was at a loss. At that moment, Alice was the most attractive woman in the world, at least to me. I wanted her more than any other woman I've ever met. When the waitress brought our food, Alice abruptly stood up and put $30 on the table. Turning to the waitress, she announced, 
We have something wrong. We must leave immediately. I started in fright. Both Alice and the waitress, who had Gwen's name on her badge, looked at my lap at the same time. Alice blushed, and Gwen looked confused and confused for a moment. Then her smile widened, and she exclaimed, I see it's time for you two to go out. Her gaze settled on me, and she added, Come back later, big boy. I finish at six. She was friendly and inviting. Alice, noticing the flirtation, grabbed my hand and glancing at the woman, dragged me outside. It wasn't far to her apartment, just two and a half blocks away. We entered the building and took the elevator to her floor. As soon as the doors closed, Alice wasted no time pinning me against the wall and running her hands over my body. It's going to be amazing, Tim. I'm going to pin you to the bed, she said impatiently. It felt like my heart was pounding wildly as I tried to catch my breath. When the elevator doors opened, two women met us on the other side, and Alice and I quickly walked past them without saying a word. One of them waved to Alice, greeting her, but she did not respond. Once in her apartment, she quickly dragged me inside, causing me to stumble over a nearby table. We wasted no time undressing, and when she stepped back to examine me, I felt a growing desire. I reciprocated, and she licked her lips in response. I took her into the bedroom and laid her gently on the bed. Just take me, she whispered. In a playful manner, she pushed me onto my back. I declared my superiority by saying that I would hold her close to me, and we began a passionate meeting. Our bond was short but powerful, and we both reached a climax that left us completely ecstatic. After we lay down, we lay together in silence, feeling each other's breath. Maybe I should have realized how strangely the day of our divorce ended, but that had to wait. Alice sat down on a chair and looked down at me. It was the most incredible intimacy we've ever shared, the best I've ever experienced. She admitted that she should have ended our marriage a long time ago. At that moment, desire overwhelmed me again. Our passion was intense and unrelenting. She peaked several times and this feeling was familiar to me from the happiest moments of our life together. And finally, I also reached the peak of pleasure. The sensations were as exciting and pleasant as before. This time I decided to separate myself from her. I knew that if I stayed, we would most likely start a new round soon, which could have a detrimental effect on my health. The divorce process took place in the morning, and Alice and I continued to go about our business throughout the day until late at night. We shared a light dinner, and I suggested going back to the Red Lobster, but she insisted on eating soup instead. We didn't get dressed to eat. After finishing the cake she brought, she looked at me. Should we talk or make love? Without thinking, I got up, took her hand and said, Damn it. And that's exactly what we did, repeatedly throughout the night. It was amazing every time, slow and gentle in some cases, intense and wild in others. She was right. We knew which buttons each other had and how to press them. Our lovemaking was like a fierce struggle to get the other to give up. Although there was no clear winner in this game, it was a pleasure to play. The next morning, we got intimate again, and she made breakfast. While we were eating, I realized that it was time to talk about our situation. Alice, I hope we can move on. The passion we shared during the divorce surpassed the passion of the honeymoon. Timmy, now I understand that getting married was a mistake. I believed that I could fulfill my promise to be faithful only to you, but now I see that this is impossible. I want to make it clear that I don't want you to leave my life. When I sang the James Taylor song, that's exactly what I meant. But maybe the time will come, Alice, when I want to settle down and start a family. Perhaps it was this desire that led you to other men. I like being intimate with you. You're amazing and you'll probably always be the best partner I've ever had. I believe that we can continue this relationship until one of us decides to end it. So let's keep it up for now. We spent the whole weekend lying in bed, taking only short breaks for food, shower, and toilet. On Saturday afternoon, there was a knock on the door. Alice quickly put on her robe and opened the door to see Maisie, the woman we had talked to in the elevator earlier. Despite her age, 
Maisie looked well-groomed. Alice greeted her with a simple, Hello, Maisie, looking into our apartment. On the contrary, I was wearing only sports shorts, and I did not try to hide that Alice and I were sharing intimate moments, although I was covered up. It's been a long time since I last saw Alice, so I wanted to make sure she was okay. I'm fine, Maisie, she said with a smile. Maisie nodded understandingly and advised Alice to continue enjoying life, waving her hand like a happy girl. Alice thanked her and assured her that we would continue in the same spirit. She giggled to herself as she closed the door. Maybe I should have invited her for coffee. She would have liked it with cream. I will not allow this. My cholesterol is already too high, she said, taking off my shorts. The next day we both went to work without deciding anything. All day I've been thinking about what happened. I knew I would never have a long-term relationship with Alice. It wasn't a partnership I was ready to enter into. But as long as the physical aspect of our relationship remained intense, I was ready to continue. That is, until I meet a woman with whom I want to settle down and start a family. Alice taught me a valuable lesson. I have to be careful in matters of the heart. Despite my doubts, I still wanted to have a family and children. Alice, on the other hand, was not monogamous like me. She had a relationship with me and three other men. Although we weren't married, I wasn't worried about her promiscuous relationships. Moreover, the thought of her feeling liberated turned me on. I was regularly tested for sexually transmitted diseases, and fortunately all the results were negative. One day when I was leaving Alice, I met Maisie, and we entered into a short dialogue with her. Maisie looked me over carefully, her expression full of meaning. Hello, do you remember me? I asked. I definitely remember you. You've always been great at setting up tents, she replied with a smile. I remember you too, Maisie. Alice mentioned that you are now divorced. Maisie nodded. Yes, it's been a year and a half. Being single is not much fun at my age, she admitted. Well, you look amazing despite your age, I reassured her. Don't you want to come in? You're Tim, right? She confirmed. Yes, I replied. We went up to the fourth floor and found Maisie's apartment across from Alice's. When we got to Maisie's door, Alice came out of hers. She giggled, looking at Maisie and me. You're a godsend, Tim. I would never have guessed it when we got married, she said with a grin. Then she turned to Maisie and added, Have a great time, Maisie. Tim is a real find. With that, she gracefully left. Maisie expected Alice and me to be intrigued. After showing me the bedroom, Maisie, a 40-year-old woman with a college son and a daughter who works downtown, turned out to be an excellent hostess. I really enjoyed spending time with her, both in conversation and in bed. Promising to keep in touch, I left the next morning feeling satisfied. One day, walking past the courthouse, I wondered about the other women living on the fourth floor. But I couldn't find out anything. It was a pleasant memory for me. Her expression became confused. It dawned on me when I remembered her name, Gwen, the waitress. You're Gwen, right? I asked. She nodded, blushing, remembering how she served us at the Red Lobster. I can't believe I forgot, she confessed. I wasn't paying attention to your faces. I introduced myself as Tim and asked if she still worked there. She explained that she now works part-time and also moonlights as a model. Gwen was a beautiful blonde with a slender figure, captivating blue eyes and graceful hips. I remember you asked me to meet you at six, but unfortunately Alice and I spent the whole weekend together. Do you meet regularly? Not really. In fact, the day we met, we had just come from the court where the decision on our divorce was made. Surprisingly, he was waiting for us with renewed vigor as you saw for yourself. It's a little weird, isn't it? But yes, we're dating now. Undoubtedly, in some ways we are compatible, and in some ways we are not. She smiled at me. Maybe you should ask me out on a date. I'm not working today. I like your words. Can we have dinner at my place tonight? I'll cook it. I'm looking forward to it, Tim. That evening, she arrived at about 6.30 p.m. She looked amazing in a short evening dress and sandals. I made us fried chicken and rice. We were talking. At the age of 25, she worked part-time as a model for clothing magazines, 
and as a waitress to make ends meet. She was single, and broke off her relationship with her longtime boyfriend almost a year ago. At the age of 34, I was financially stable, had a successful career in a law firm, lived independently in my own apartment, and had a good car. Alice, Maisie, and I dated regularly, and I also had a casual affair with a woman from the court, although I was ready for something more serious. Gwen turned out to be very kind. Intrigued by her, I decided to start a romantic relationship with her and see where it would lead. On our first evening together, we agreed that I would take her home. On the threshold she surprised me with a kiss, causing excitement. But Gwen didn't rush things, and as we spent more and more time together, I began to have genuine feelings for her. Her beauty and intelligence captivated me, and I believed that she reciprocated my love. On the third date, we finally shared a moment of intimacy. It was a special experience and I felt a deep connection with her. At that moment, I decided to end my relationships with other women in order to focus only on Gwen. A few weeks later, after a night of intense lovemaking, Gwen and I lay together in silence. Our relationship wasn't always filled with tender moments. Sometimes we both craved a rougher intimacy. When we were lying together, I finally confessed my feelings to her, confessed that I was in love. Gwen was delighted with my confession and told me that since we met, she has been looking only at me. It was a revelation that brought us even closer together. My love for you, Tim, is deep, but I can't help but worry that you're not faithful to me. Will you always doubt my loyalty? If I promise to be with you alone, I will keep that promise. I must admit I have doubts about this. But if you assure me of your loyalty, I will do everything in my power to resolve all issues related to loyalty. So let's make a deal. I will be faithful to you, and you will do the same for me. We will succeed. Two weeks later I asked a question, and three months later we tied the knot. Although her parents live in Chicago, we decided to hold our ceremony elsewhere. She was by no means extravagant. Among our guests were Alice and Maisie, whom I introduced to Gwen shortly after my proposal. Although Alice was friendly to her, I felt that Gwen was a little depressed. Maybe our relationship wasn't based on love, but I knew that she would miss physical intimacy. After the wedding, Gwen and I went to the Bahamas for our honeymoon, which was just fantastic. After moving into my apartment, everything went smoothly. My wife and I quickly decided to start a family, and three years later we had two children, Thomas and Eileen. I also became a partner in the firm and bought a house in the nearest suburb. All this time I have been in touch with my ex Alice, not the one who is considered beautiful. She married her colleague, Larry Gibson, a year after my wife and I tied the knot. Alice and Larry had two sons, Lawrence and Raymond, and they were doing well. They moved into the house next door to Gwen and me. The four of us often crossed paths in the neighborhood. Soon, our children started attending the same play school. Gwen and Alice struck up a friendship, but Larry was wary of me. He should have doubted my intentions towards Alice, and he had good reason to do so. The chemistry between Alice and me remained palpable. Gwen knew about it, but she believed in me. Over time, she even began to trust Alice and did not seek a closer relationship with me. But Larry, who watched the sparks flare up between us from time to time, was always on the lookout. He couldn't be expected to relax, but we found common ground in our shared love of baseball. We played together on the men's team in the old-timers leagues, where we both excelled. We even had season tickets to gems, MLB games, and we often attended games together as fans. One day, I felt obliged to tell him about my relationship with Alice, past and present. As we were waiting to leave the garage at the Jam Park after the game, I met Larry's gaze and expressed my firm position. I want to make it clear that I will never have an intimate relationship with Alice. She's married, I'm married, and it just won't happen again. I felt that this question was bothering Larry. Tim, I appreciate your directness in this matter, he replied. If you could just trust Alice and me, we could have a strong friendship. But obviously there are still lingering feelings between you because of your past. I can't ignore it. There is a history between us, 
We had chemistry, but I promise you she probably said the same thing. We have to stop this if possible. Tim, it seems to me that I only see you both from time to time, like at the dance club last month. It looks like you've had some incredible intimate moments together. And frankly, it's frustrating. I often wonder who she fantasizes about during our intimacy. About me, about you, or maybe about some famous actor. Did you ever think about her when you were with Gwen? No, but that doesn't mean she doesn't come to my mind. We had wonderful memories. Maybe even better than the ones we shared. This thought haunts me. Larry, I had a full-fledged physical relationship with Alice during and after our marriage, but after the divorce they lost their spark. Love is gone. She's always been good at relationships like some of the others I've been with. I have a wonderful intimacy with Gwen. Alice was no better than Gwen, and others might be no worse. It is love that makes sex activities special. You have it with Alice, and I have it with Gwen. Okay, I understand what you're talking about. I didn't think about it that way. Thank you. And that made it easier for all four of us to have this conversation. Of course, I lied to him. None of my intimate encounters with women can compare to the experience I shared with Alice after the divorce. I still think about it, although not every day. When I see her, I can tell that she remembers it too. Maybe when we're both in our 80s and if our spouses are no longer with us in the nursing home, we'll go back to that passionate relationship and see if we can make love to the very end. My best friend Simon tried to persuade me to join the army, joking that he would travel the world, meet interesting people, and then destroy them. Despite the dark humor, I decided to join the same unit as him, and even volunteered for the special forces unit in which he served. The intense training sessions were difficult, but with Simon by her side, they could be overcome. Our group was sent to a bustling city where life was relatively calm. It was there that I found love and quickly married my beloved. Pam, an amazing woman, became my life partner. I have served for 10 years, been happily married for 8 years now, and am raising our two beloved daughters, Kate and Melissa, aged 7 and 5 respectively, next to Pam. Unlike other army units, mine did not require frequent business trips. We left for a period of two days to two weeks, but not more often. I was lucky that I was at home regularly, almost every day of the year. Life was as ordinary and stable as it could be. At one time I was married to a woman I adored, and I had a family that meant everything to me. But everything changed when Osama bin Laden carried out his terrible terrorist attack. Unexpectedly, my friend Simon and I were asked to go on vacation to Iraq in the same year. It was hard to say goodbye to loved ones, but Pam and I took responsibility. While performing our duties during the preparation and invasion, we were looking forward to returning home. Our anticipation faded when we received an order from the regimental commander of the political department to stay in Iraq and continue the fight to preserve peace. Simon, known for his wit, couldn't resist teasing the politician. Sir, fighting for peace is like trying to preserve innocence by having sexual intercourse, he grumbled. The audience burst into laughter and the speaker left in despair. We had no idea that the world would turn out to be more brutal than the offensive itself. Unlike the invasion operation, where the enemy was dressed in uniform, losses were higher during the peacekeeping mission. Our unit was very tense. It was behind enemy lines for up to four weeks, and then returned to base for a two-week respite. Although we were technically behind enemy lines, it was impossible to pinpoint our exact location on the map. There was uncertainty hanging over us because we never knew when we would be able to return home. To stay in touch with my loved ones, I went on Skype every night to chat with Pam, Kate, and Mel. It was my way of making sure they wouldn't forget my face during my absence. Three weeks after the start of our last mission, the situation has changed for the worse. We were assigned to attack a base where, according to rumors, there were about a hundred enemy soldiers. There were about a thousand people in front of us, surpassing our group of twelve people. Having made a quick decision, we hastily retreated. It was only two days later that the Black Hawks came for us. By that time, only four of us could walk, 
and unfortunately, three of our comrades died. The heaviest blow fell on Simon, who injured the tendons in the back of his knee. Although it did not endanger his life, his military career was over. He was sent to the hospital in our hometown along with other wounded, and we were left to recover in the village. In order to integrate back into society, it is important for us to give priority to our psychological health. It was clear to everyone that the size of our group was decreasing. History shows that when the military loses more than 10% of its personnel, morale can suffer greatly. This may explain why Roman officers resorted to drastic measures, such as killing one in 10 soldiers, to maintain discipline. Although this tactic may seem cruel, it was effective in maintaining the cohesion of the troops. Roman legions rarely fled battles. After returning from a difficult assignment and nine months of service, I found myself in the dining room, using my laptop to send a letter to one of the widows of a deceased comrade. I've been trying to contact all three widows since the army officially informed them of their husband's deaths. While the army followed bureaucratic procedures, our unit was cohesive, and I wanted to take a more personal approach to show my support for these women whom I knew personally. All of them, unlike me, lived at the base. The third conversation turned out to be especially difficult for me. In the previous two conversations, I honestly told them that their husbands passed away quickly and painlessly. But this time I had to make up a story. As the senior officer in my platoon, I took it upon myself to conduct all negotiations with women who have lost their loved ones. If they were being deceived, then it had to be a consistent deception on my part. Suddenly a small Skype message appeared on my laptop screen. Kate Young is online, and I really wanted to take my mind off an emotionally draining task, so I quickly dialed her number. A few seconds later, my eldest daughter's sweet face appeared on the screen, sitting on the couch in our living room with the laptop she received last Christmas. Dad! She squeaked, and her sister joined the conversation. Soon I was talking to the two main reasons for my life, and they were talking to me as fast as they could. For the next 30 minutes, we enjoyed chatting about school, a recent trip to the zoo, and various other topics. While we were talking, I felt like I was starting to relax. The irresistible urge to lash out at someone and cause harm was gradually going away. Looking at my watch, I realized that it was time for them to go to bed and I tried to end our conversation. Where's your mom? I asked Mel, but immediately discovered that Katie was in the kitchen with Uncle Nick, her mom's new friend, and hiding behind the frame. Mel mentioned that he went to the zoo with them today, and I felt a chill run down my spine. Pam and I knew we didn't have a brother named Nick. I tried to suppress the sudden wave of anxiety that surged through me, reminding myself to stay calm. How long has Uncle Nick started coming to this house? I asked, trying to speak dispassionately. I'm not an actor, I just make a living destroying people, I added sarcastically. Wasn't it just after Easter, Dad? That was two months ago. Pam's silence about new friends told me a lot. I asked how often Mom sees Uncle Nick, and got confirmation that he's almost always around. At that moment, I heard Kate whispering off-screen, she mentioned that mom doesn't want us to talk about Uncle Nick. My suspicions turned into certainty, and anger flared up in me. I tried my best to keep my emotions under control. Kate, come to the screen, I demanded. Kate looked puzzled. Kate, is Uncle Nick staying the night? Yes, Daddy. Oh no, not that. I tried my best to contain the intense anger that threatened to overwhelm me. So you have a good relationship with Uncle Nick? Again, both girls answered at the same time. It was hard to hear both of them at once. I caught the words slippery and he hit me, doesn't like us. Okay, girls, be quiet. Now, Kate, you're the first. No, Dad, we don't love him and he doesn't care about us. In the absence of Mom, he treats us badly. I suspect he might harm her. Sometimes I hear screams from her bedroom when he stays the night. It really hurts me to hear this from my own child. 
Serving in the army has taught me to think quickly in emergency situations, and I have developed this skill in numerous life-threatening situations. Does this jacket hanging by the front door belong to Nick? Yes, Dad. Kate, could you take it and check if there's a wallet in one of the pockets? She quickly followed my instructions. In five minutes, I found out Uncle Nick's full name, address, and license number. I also found his employer's security card. Kate helped me find out details about his car, including the make, model, and license plate. Okay, girls, I need to make a quick phone call. Please keep the screens on and wait for my return, I instructed. As a result, the call lasted more than 10 minutes, but fortunately Simon's wife Julia was at home, and she did not have to go to the hospital. After that, I went back to my computer and invited the girls to come closer. Hey, my lovely princesses, would you like to stay at Aunt Julia's house for a few days? They always fulfilled this request with pleasure. Julia and Simon had three children about the same age as my daughters, and they were close friends. Dad, we haven't seen them in ages, Mel exclaimed. So Pam was avoiding our friends, I replied. Well, go to your rooms and pack your clothes and toys. That's enough for a few days, and Aunt Julia will pick you up soon. Kate, could you take the laptop to the kitchen and show Mom the screen? I need to talk to her. After that, you can go pack your things. Okay, Dad. While I was being shown the house, Kate took the laptop to the kitchen. Inside, I saw Pam and a young man sitting at a table with a bottle of wine. They were so engrossed in the conversation that they didn't notice Kate put her laptop on the table until she said, Mom, Dad wants to talk to you. They both turned around abruptly, shock reflected on their faces as they looked at the screen. There was fear on Pam's face, and the man looked like he wanted to disappear under the table. Hi, Pam. How are you? I greeted her acknowledging the presence of her new companion, Nick. Their mouths were moving, but there were no words, which prompted me to continue. Come on, Pam, you should have known this day would come. Didn't you prepare a little explanation for me? It was clear that he didn't. Trying to deceive, unaware of her inability to lie, she stumbled over the words. I mean, it was clear as day that she was trying to deceive me as if a light bulb was flashing on her head. He's just a friend of Davy's, Pam insisted, but I didn't buy it. The girls had already blabbed about her secret relationship with him. Finally, Pam decided to confess. Her brave boyfriend tried to leave, but she stopped him and pulled him back to the table. As I watched her, her face, like in a movie, reflected different reactions. I'm sorry, Dave, but I felt incredibly lonely in your absence. I met Nick, and we had feelings for each other. After a moment of silence, I tried to keep my composure and continue the conversation. I wanted to get mad at them, but I knew it wouldn't solve anything. That's not true, Pam. This is the longest absence I've had in the nine years of our marriage. I warned you about the difficulties in our lives even before the wedding, and you agreed. She looked confused by my words. I must say, my dear, that the best thing would be to wait until I am at home, in a country where any distraction can be fatal, and only then inform me of your desire to leave. And then, by giving me a chance to change my mind, we could officially end our relationship before you take a lover. Unfortunately, Pam intervened. I'm sorry, Dave, but the ship has already sailed. And what's going to happen next, Pam? Are you seriously going to leave me and run off into the sunset with that idiot? She couldn't even bring herself to look up and just nodded in response. And in your little dream, you're just going to take my kids away from me, aren't you? The way I was talking must have hit a nerve because she visibly flinched. It was clear that the thought that this would not happen had not even crossed her mind. Listen, Pam, you know I study psychology. Do you remember all these conversations we had about what shapes children, nature or upbringing, genetics or environment? And what happens if the children go with you? They will inherit your treacherous genes and be raised in a world of dishonesty and immorality. Believe me, this cannot be allowed. Pam recoiled in shock from my harsh words, uttered in one breath. 
Finally, the idiot stood up for her. Wait, shut up, you idiot. Another skill that is taught in the army is the ability to quickly take control of those on the opposite side. He stopped talking when the screen suddenly caught his attention, and Pam announced her intention to open the door. I told her to wait because Julia came to pick up the kids. She will take them to her house for the night and send them to school in the morning. I reminded Pam to make sure the kids packed everything they needed before they returned so we could talk in peace. Pam got up from her seat, and Nick tried to follow her example. Sit down, you idiot! I snapped, forcing him to quickly take his place in the chair and stroking the bruised back of his head. I kept a calm expression on my face until Pam returned after a long absence. This dumb fool was trying to start a conversation about life in Iraq. Stuart noticed and replaced my glass, and I asked for privacy so that there would be no witnesses to what would happen next. Eventually, Pam came back and started apologizing, but I interrupted her. I have two questions for Nick. Did you know she was married? His answer that he was in love with her was enough for me to say yes. The second question was about my profession. Pam said that I served in the Iraqi Air Force, but I corrected her by saying that I actually served in the Army. There seemed to be some confusion because Pam thought I was flying in the air. I explained that I had served in the Army, namely in a regiment known as the Special Air Service. Seeing that he was not impressed, I explained that we are usually called SAS. The look of horror on his face indicated that he had finally understood the essence of my profession. The reputation of the SAS was known to every person on the planet. It was well known that they were the authors of books on special forces training, and that they were an elite unit that trained special forces all over the world. There were rumors that if you got into the SAS, you wouldn't even realize it until you were brought before the court of Lucifer himself. The man suddenly realized the gravity of his situation. Although the microphone didn't pick up any sound, his lips unmistakably pronounced the word shit. And at that moment, Mr. Nick Brown of Borderdale, Pender Court No. 12, realized that he was in big trouble. I destroy the bad guys. I moved closer to him, my face filling the screen. His expression was pitiful, and his complexion was pale. For sleeping with my wife, ruining my marriage, and endangering the future of my daughters, I sentence you to responsibility. I angrily announced. What? What? He stuttered, his mouth moving like a gasping fish. Yes, I'm going to kill you, I repeated. Before I could do anything, Pam intervened. Dave, let's be honest, macho. I know you're a military man and all that, but how many people have you really destroyed? Her casual tone took me by surprise. I shifted my attention from Nick's image on the screen to her. I was even more struck by the defiant expression on her face. It dawned on me that she had no idea about my activities in general. Like many in the special forces, I kept my job a secret. Only our inner circle knew about my participation in the SAS. I decided not to tell her about my activities in Iraq, because I didn't want her to worry. Instead, I calmly replied, I've been at the base for the last week, so I didn't have to destroy anyone. But in the previous week, I had destroyed about 10 or 12 opponents. It was a relatively quiet week. I didn't keep track of the exact number because at that moment it didn't seem significant to me. Most of them were shot, but one man caught me off guard while I was reloading, and I had to defend myself by stabbing him. I aimed upwards, piercing his heart through the diaphragm. They say the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, Pam. Thanks to the wonders of Skype, we have connected from different parts of the globe. The man she had seen only a short time ago now appeared to her in the form of a dangerous and vicious stranger. I was watching a man who was now filled with intense fear. Honey, it's important for you to understand that I didn't have any bad feelings for these people. They were just doing their job. I didn't feel any remorse towards the man I destroyed, even when I witnessed his death. Just imagine what I do to those whom I sincerely despise. Noticing Nick's fear, I turned my attention to him. Are you still staying here, you idiot? The further away from my house, the better your chances of survival. Rest assured my blade is meant for you, and it is an oath that you will never be able to forget. With a loud exclamation, 
he jumped up from his chair and ran out of the room. I heard the door slam. Now she was imitating a goldfish, and her expression was one of suffering. I gave her time to recover, knowing that her thoughts were not so positive. In the end, she asked quietly, Are you going to destroy me too? Her question made me think, I haven't decided her fate yet. Pam, I haven't made a decision yet. I only know one thing. After you allowed this unsuitable person to enter my house and began sleeping with him, and even my daughters could hear it, it became clear that you were not suitable for the role of mother to our children. Kate informed me about the disturbing sounds she heard when he was with you at night, and she's worried that he might harm you. Pam's already terrified expression was made even scarier by this revelation. One thing is for sure. My daughters will grow up with a deep understanding of how I feel about infidelity. Gathering my thoughts, I switched from an emotional reaction to a more logical perspective. They were both in a balanced state. It has been documented that the death of one parent can have less impact on children than the upheaval associated with divorce. Pam, unsurprisingly, remained silent in response to this. She understood that this statement put her in front of two unattractive options. No, Pam, I think it would be unacceptable to harm you. I care about you, and so far I have no reason to consider you a bad mother. Before Pam could get too excited, I intervened. Listen, Pam, if I find Nick one day and you're with him, I won't hesitate to hurt you too. Going to the police won't save you, and if you don't prepare the divorce papers for me to sign when I get home, the consequences will be serious. Do a little research, Pam. Many criminals were convicted without finding a body. Rest assured, your case will not be an exception. I watched as understanding slowly dawned on her. She seemed to be on the verge of breaking down. Are you really going to kill Nick? Pam asked me. I took a deep breath before replying. This country has changed me. I've seen too many deaths and taken too many lives to have any semblance of humanity left in me. When I finish Nick off, I won't feel guilty. Pam's eyes filled with tears for the first time. I just wanted to put an end to it. Remember that, Pam, I warned her. If you had behaved differently, maybe I would have understood you. After the divorce, I will get a house and full custody of the children. The order of attendance will be determined by me because I believe that it is more in the interests of children. After my return, you will have to look for a new place to live, but I will help you with your living expenses for a reasonable period of time until you can get back on your feet. I'll give you the details of an army lawyer, since civilian judges usually speak well of them. After returning, I plan to work as an instructor at the base so that I can be at home with our daughters every evening. We'll do fine without you. I have decided that I will not come back here anymore. Before returning home, I was worried about my ability to handle the situation, but it turned out that this was not a problem. Now I'm worried about how it will affect my soul if I have to keep taking the lives of others. It will be a heavy burden for me. Good night, Pam. Please do not contact me by email or phone until I return. I don't want any surprises waiting for me when I get back. Just follow my instructions and you will soon find happiness, although it may not be the life you once imagined. You've made a decision, and now it's time to face the consequences. That was the end of the conversation. Three weeks later I returned home and was glad to see Kate and Mel again. I tried to explain to them that their mother would no longer live with us, but they were at a loss. But the presence of Julia, Simon, and their children distracted their attention. Whenever Kate and Mel saw Simon, they asked him why he was walking so strangely. Each time, Simon would come up with a new, even more fantastic story to entertain them. When I got off the plane, the police met me. They informed me that they had spoken to my wife, who did not confirm his story. I didn't use any clever evasion techniques, but I didn't admit to anything either. As a result, they couldn't do anything except warn me that they would be watching my actions. The divorce went through with minimal changes on my part. I decided to let my daughters decide for themselves how often they would visit their mother. 
It struck me how the children, with their immature minds, rightly blamed her for the pain we all felt. They seemed to avoid her at all costs. It was only later that I found out that Julia played a significant role in this. She picked them up from school every day, allowing them to spend time with their old friends, Julia and Simon's children. This left little time for their frustrated and disinterested mother. Pam asked about the possibility of reconciliation, but I just let the cold, heartless part of me get the better of me and stared back at her. After that incident, we never brought up the subject again. She took precautions so that we would never be alone. It was clear that I had scared her. I found a job as an instructor at the base, which allowed me to be at home every evening. Despite all our efforts to raise children together, the emotional impact of divorce is always present. Psychologists advise parents to try to stay together, unless it's about cruelty. Fortunately, life turned out well. Four years and two months later, Percy Newmont finally found peace. He spent time with friends hunting in the wilderness using a bow. Hours passed during these classes, and he did not think about his past problems. Looking at his friend Peter, he noticed that they were united by camaraderie. Together with two other people, they spent a lot of time together. Peter met his gaze and smiled, making Percy think that life was good. The only thing he regretted was missing their weekly poker game on Wednesday night, the very night he betrayed Peter by sleeping with his wife. Percy's move across two states in search of a new identity was a difficult journey that dealt him a financial blow. But despite the difficulties, in the end, everything fell into place. Returning to Borderdale last month for his mother's funeral was a risky decision that Percy knew he had to make. And although he felt stupid hiding in the church and avoiding contact with relatives, it was impossible to ignore the fact that she was his mother. Suddenly, a sharp blow knocked Percy onto his back, and he was surprised to see an arrow sticking out of his chest just below his heart. He was confused, trying to figure out what was going on. His three friends were right behind him. Why did he feel a blow from the front? He lost consciousness and regained consciousness only later, when he was alone with Peter. The others went to get help. Suddenly, the sharp pain returned, which at first made him flinch. Nick couldn't understand why Peter was pulling out the feathers of an arrow with a grin on his face. The agony became unbearable, and Nick lost consciousness again. Ten minutes passed before he succumbed to his injuries. The coroner examined the body without much reverence, which was common for him when dealing with the consequences of hunting accidents. Meanwhile, two weeks later, Pam was sitting alone in her twelfth floor apartment, tears streaming down her face. She had been crying for three hours ever since her lover John left her. What's wrong with me? She mused, feeling lost and broken. After reflecting on the past four years, she realized that she blamed Nick for everything. Feeling the pressure of the biological clock, she hurried to marry me in order to satisfy her desire to have children. But when Nick came into her life, she saw a chance to start over with a new partner and the opportunity to have children. Without hesitation, she rushed into a new relationship. But after Nick suddenly disappeared, she began to doubt that her feelings for him were really mutual. It became clear that he left without hesitation, leaving her to reflect on the one-sided nature of their love. She was shocked to find that he had left his jacket and wallet. Desperate to find answers, she went to his apartment and searched for him for two days after his disappearance, but he was nowhere to be found. The most painful thing was the realization that, having escaped, he did not seem to care about her well-being. Over the next year, children were the main cause of her depression. She had just started legal proceedings to regain custody of her daughters, Kate and Mel, when I returned from Iraq and stopped the process. When she tried to contact the girls after that, she was only disappointed. There was resentment in the conversation, as if they blamed her for something. She saw them about once a week, until a woman moved in with me, just nine months after Pam left. She was a journalist who covered the history of awarding medals to me and my friends. After that, the girls stopped talking to her on the phone. In the end, she resorted to parking near the school. 
but it didn't help either when she saw both girls running up to the woman and hugging her as if she were their mother. Besides, they didn't even call her on her birthday that year. Her pain subsided when she met Pete, who was older but shared her desire to have a family. Eight months later they moved in together and talked about the wedding and the children. But two weeks later, Pete confessed that he had found another one and asked her to leave. The following year, a similar situation occurred with Randy. They quickly found a common language, moved in together four months later, but three weeks later, Randy broke off the relationship, reconciling with his ex-wife. Pam decided to have a series of one-night stands in the hope of boosting her self-confidence, but it ended up being exactly the opposite. She dreamed of settling down with John, although she realized that there was less and less time for having children. And yet she resisted starting a relationship with him too quickly. It was only a year later that she finally succumbed to his gentle persuasions and allowed him to move in with her. With undisguised doubt, she admitted that being close to John was the most pleasant thing for her after me. When she returned home from work, John was waiting for her at the door of the apartment with her packed things. Without explaining anything, he just told her that he was leaving. Avoiding eye contact, he picked up his bags and walked out the door. Carrying out the last bag, he muttered, slutty girl, leaving her confused and offended. She was by no means unfaithful to him. Wiping away tears, Pam glanced at the unopened mail on the coffee table. There was one empty envelope among the letters. Despite the desire to read the mysterious message, she managed to resist the temptation. When John left, unable to contain his curiosity any longer, she finally opened the envelope. Inside, she found a newspaper clipping that puzzled her. The article told the tragic story of a hunter who died from an arrow strike, but she couldn't understand why anyone would want to tell her such a dark story. But as she read on, her confusion turned to shock when she realized that the victim was none other than Nick Brown, a resident of Borderdale. The newspaper slipped from her trembling fingers as she realized the shocking news. While she was thinking, her thoughts turned to Nick, then to Pat and Randy. Eventually, her thoughts settled on me. She tried to convince herself that she wasn't thinking about me, but deep down she knew what she was thinking about. Four years ago, she had everything, but trying to find the last part of herself, she was left with nothing. Shocked by this realization, she looked through the sliding door to the balcony and looked at the huge but mesmerizing picture of the parking lot located 12 floors below. She understood that she was the only one to blame for her misfortune, and she needed to move on with it. 